Chapter 1 of Liza of Lambeth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hatton43, blog de la quinzaine dot wordpress dot com. Liza of Lambeth by W. Somerset Maugham. 1. It was the first Saturday afternoon in August. It had been broiling hot all day, with a cloudless sky, and the sun had been beating down on the houses, so that the top rooms were like ovens. But now, with the approach of evening, it was cooler, and everyone in Veer Street was out of doors. Veer Street, Lambeth, is a short, straight street leading out of the Westminster Bridge Road. It has forty houses on one side, and forty houses on the other, and these eighty houses are very much more like one another than ever peas are like peas, or young ladies like young ladies. They are newish, three-storey buildings of dingy grey brick with slate roofs, and they are perfectly flat, without a bow window or even a projecting cornice or window sill to break the straightness of the line from one end of the street to the other. This Saturday afternoon the street was full of life. No traffic came down Veer Street, and the cemented space between the pavements was given up to children. Several games of cricket were being played by wildly excited boys, using coats for wickets, an old tennis ball or a bundle of rags tied together for a ball, and generally an old broomstick for a bat. The wicket was so large and the bat so small that the man in was always getting bowled. When heated quarrels would arise, the batter absolutely refusing to go out, and the bowler absolutely insisting on going in. The girls were more peaceable. They were chiefly employed in skipping, and only abused one another mildly when the rope was not properly turned or the skipper did not jump sufficiently high. Worst off of all were the very young children, for there had been no rain for weeks, and the street was as dry and clean as a covered court, and, in the lack of mud to wallow in, they sat about the road, disconsolate as poets. The number of babies was prodigious. They sprawled about everywhere, on the pavement, round the doors, and about their mother's skirts. The grown-ups were gathered round the open doors. There were usually two women squatting on the doorstep, and two or three more seated on either side of on chairs. They were invariably nursing babies, and most of them showed clear signs that the present object of the maternal care would soon be ousted by a new arrival. Men were less numerous, but such as there were leant against the walls, smoking or sat on the sills of the ground-floor windows. It was the dead season in Beer Street, as much as in Belgravia, and really, if it had not been for babies just come, or just about to come, and an opportune murder in a neighbouring doss house, there would have been nothing whatever to talk about. As it was, little groups talked quietly, discussing the atrocity, or the merits of the local midwives, comparing the circumstances of their various confinements. "'You'll be having your little trouble soon, eh, Polly?' asked one good lady of another. "'Oh, I reckon I've got another two months to go yet,' answered Polly." Well, said a third, I wouldn't have thought you'd go so long by the look of you. I hope you'll have it easier this time, my dear, said a very stout old person, a woman of great importance. She said she wasn't going to have no more when the last one come. This remark came from Polly's husband. Ah, said the stout old lady, who was in the business and boasted vast experience. That's what they all says, but Lord bless you, they don't mean it. Well, I've got three, and I'm not going to have no more. Fly me, if I will. Tain't good enough, that's what I says. You're about right there, old gal, said Polly. My word, Harry, if you have any more, I'll get a divorce, that I will. At that moment, an organ grider turned the corner and came down the street. Good biz, here's an organ, cried half a dozen people at once. The organ man was an Italian, with a shock of black hair and a ferocious moustache. Drawing his organ to a favourable spot, he stopped released his shoulder from the leather straps by which he dragged it, and cocking his large soft hat on the side of his head, began turning the handle. It was a lively tune, and in less than no time a little crowd had gathered round to listen, chiefly the young men and the maidens, for the married ladies were never in a fit state to dance, and therefore disinclined to trouble themselves to stand round the organ. There was a moment's hesitation at opening the ball. Then one girl said to another, Come on, Flory, you and me ain't shy. We'll begin and bust it. The two girls took hold of one another, one acting gentleman, the other lady. Three or four more pairs of girls immediately joined them, and they began a waltz. They held themselves very upright, with an air of grave dignity, which was quite impressive, glided slowly about, 
making their steps with the utmost precision, bearing themselves with sufficient decorum for a court ball. After a while, the men began to itch for a turn, and two of them, taking hold of one another in the most approved fashion, waltzed round the circle with the gravity of judges. All at once there was a cry, There's Liza! And several members of the group turned and called out, Ooh, look at Liza! The dancers stopped to see the sight, and the organ grinder, having come to the end of his tune, ceased turning the handle and looked to see what was the excitement. Ooh, Liza, they called out. Look at Liza, ooh, I say. It was a young girl of about eighteen, with dark eyes and an enormous fringe, puffed out and curled and frizzed, covering her whole forehead from side to side, and coming down to meet her eyebrows. She was dressed in brilliant violet and with great lappets of velvet, and she had on her head an enormous black hat covered with feathers. I'll say, ain't she got up dossy? called the groups at the doors as she passed. Dressed to death, and kill the fashion, that's what I calls it. Liza saw what a sensation she was creating. She arched her back and lifted her head, and walked down the street, swaying her body from side to side, and swaying her along as though the whole place belonged to her. Have you bought the street, Bill? shouted one youth and then half a dozen burst forth at once, as if by inspiration. Knocked him in the old Kent Road. It was immediately taken up by a dozen more, and they all yelled it out. Knocked him in the old Kent Road. Yeah, I knocked him in the old Kent Road. Who, Liza? they shouted. The whole street joined in, and they gave long, shrill, ear-piecing shrieks, and strange calls that rung down the street and echoed back again. Extra special, called out a wag. Who, Liza? Ooh, ooh, yells and whistles, and then it thundered forth again. Knocked him in the old Kent Road. Liza put on the air of a conquering hero, and sauntered on, enchanted at the uproar. She stuck out her elbows and jerked her head on one side, and said to herself as she passed through the bellowing crowd, This is jam. Knocked him in the old Kent Road. When she came to the group round the barrel organ, one of the girls cried out to her, Is that your new dress, Liza? Well, it don't look like my old one, do it? said Liza. Where did you get it? asked another friend, rather enviously. Picked up in the street, of course, scornfully answered Liza. I believe it's the same one as I saw in the pawnbrokers down the road, said one of the men to tease her. That's it. What was you doing in there, pledging your shirt, or was it your trousers? Yeah, I wouldn't get a second-hand dress at a pawnbroker's. Gone, said Liza indignantly. I'll swipe you over the snitch if you talk to me. I got the materials in the West End, didn't I? And I had it made up by my court dressmaker, so you jolly well dry up, old Jelly Belly. Gone, was the reply. Liza had been so intent on her new dress and the comment it was exciting that she had not noticed the organ. Ooh, I say, let's have some dancing, she said as soon as she saw it. Come on, Sally, she said to one of the girls. You and me will dance together. Grind away, old cock. The man turned on a new tune, and the organ began to play the intermezzo from the Cavalleria. Other couples quickly followed Liza's example, and they began to waltz round with the same solemnity as before. But Liza outdid them all. If the others were as stately as queens, she was as stately as an empress. The gravity and dignity with which she waltzed was something appalling. You felt that the minuet was a frolic in comparison. It would have been a fitting measure to tread round the grave of the première danseuse, or at the funeral of a professional humorist. And the graces she put on, the languor of the eyes, the contemptuous curl of the lips, the exquisite turn of the hand, the dainty arching of the foot, you felt there could be no questioning her right to the tyranny of Vere Street. Suddenly she stopped short and disengaged herself from her companion. Ooh, I say, she said, this is too blooming slow, it gives me the sick. That is not precisely what she said, but it is impossible always to give the exact, unexpurgated words of Liza and the other personages of the story. The reader is therefore entreated with his thoughts to piece out the necessary imperfections of the dialogue. It's too blooming slow, she said again. It gives me the sick. Let's have something a bit more lively than this here waltz. You stand over there, Sally, and we'll show him how to skirt dance. They all stopped waltzing. Talk of the ballet at the Canterbury in South London. You just wait till you see the ballet at Veer Street, Lambeth. We'll knock em. She went up to the organ grinder. Now then, Italiano, she said to him. You buck up. Give us a tune that's got some guts in it, see? She caught hold of his big hat and squashed it down over his eyes. 
The man grinned from ear to ear, and touching the little catch at the side, began to play a lively tune such as Liza had asked for. The men had fallen out, but several girls had put themselves in position, in couples, standing face to face, and immediately the music struck up, they began. They held up their skirts on each side so as to show their feet, and proceeded to go through the difficult steps and motions of the dance. Liza was right, they could not have done it better in a trained ballet, but the best dancer of them all was Liza. She threw her whole soul into it, forgetting the stiff bearing which she had thought proper to the waltz, and casting off its elaborate graces. She gave herself up entirely to the present pleasure. Gradually, the other couple stood aside, so that Liza and Sally were left alone. They paced it carefully, watching each other's steps, and as if by instinct, performing corresponding movements, so as to make the whole a thing of symmetry. I'm about done, said Sally, blowing and puffing. I've had enough of it. Go on, Liza, cried out a dozen voices when Sally stopped. She gave no sign of having heard them, other than calmly to continue her dance. She glided through the steps and swayed about, and manipulated her skirt, all with the most charming grace imaginable. Then, the music altering, she changed the style of her dancing. Her feet moved more quickly, and did not keep so strictly to the ground. She was getting excited at the admiration of the onlookers, but her dance grew wilder and more daring. She lifted her skirts higher, brought in new and more difficult movements into her improvisation, kicking up her legs, she did the wonderful twist, backwards and forwards, of which the dancer is proud. Look at her legs! cried one of the men. Look at her stockings, shouted another, and indeed they were remarkable, for Liza had chosen them of the same brilliant hue as her dress, and was herself most proud of the harmony. Her dance became gayer. Her feet scarcely touched the ground. She whirled round madly. Take care you don't split, cried one of the wags, at a very audacious kick. The words were hardly out of his mouth when Liza, with a gigantic effort, raised her foot and kicked off his hat. The feet was greeted with applause and she went on making turns and twists, flourishing her skirts, kicking higher and higher, and finally, among a volley of shouts, fell on her hands and turned head over heels in a magnificent Catherine wheel. Then, scrambling to her feet again, she tumbled into the arms of a young man standing in the front of the ring. "'That's right, Liza," he said. "'Give us a kiss now,' and promptly tried to take one. "'Get out,' said Liza, pushing him away, not too gently. "'Yes, give us a kiss,' cried another, running up to her. I'll smack you in the face, said Liza, elegantly as she dodged him. Catch hold on her, Bill, cried a third, and we'll all kiss her. No, you won't, shrieked Liza, beginning to run. Come on, then, they cried. We'll catch her. She dodged in and out, between their legs, under their arms, and then getting clear of the little crowd, caught up her skirts so that they might not hinder her, and took to her heels along the street. A score of men set in chase, whistling, shouting, yelling, people at the doors looked up to see the fun and cried out to her as she dashed past. She ran like the wind. Suddenly a man from the side darted into the middle of the road, stood straight in her way, and before she knew where she was, she had jumped shrieking into his arms, and he, lifting her up to him, had imprinted two sounding kisses on her cheeks. Oh, you, she said. Her expression was quite unprintable, nor can it be euphemised. There was a shout of laughter from the bystanders, and the young men in chase of her and Liza, looking up, saw a big, bearded man whom she had never seen before. She blushed to the very roots of her hair, quickly extricated herself from his arms, and amid the jeers and laughter of everyone, slid into the door of the nearest house and was lost to view. End of chapter one. Chapter 2 of Liza of Lambeth by W. Somerset Maugham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hatton43, blog de la .com. Liza and her mother were having supper. Mrs. Kemp was an elderly woman, short and rather stout, with a red face and grey hair brushed tight back over her forehead. She had been a widow for many years and since her husband's death had lived with Liza in the ground floor front room in which they were now sitting. Her husband had been a soldier, and from a grateful country she received a pension large enough to keep her from starvation, and by charring and doing such odd jobs as she could get, she earned a little extra to supply herself with liquor. Liza was able to make her own living by working at a factory. Mrs. Kemp was rather sulky this evening. What was you doing this afternoon, Liza? she asked. 
I was in the street. You're always in the street when I want you. I didn't know as how you wanted me, mother, answered Liza. Well, you might have come to see me. I might have been dead for all you knew. Liza said nothing. My rheumatics was that bad today that I don't know what to do with myself. The doctor said I was to be rubbed with that stuff he give me, but he won't never do nothing for me. Well, mother, said Liza, your rheumatics was all right yesterday. I know what you was doing. You was showing off that new dress of yours. Pretty waste of money, that is, instead of giving it to me to save up. And for the matter of that, I wanted a new dress far worse than you did, but of course, I don't matter. Liza did not answer, and Mrs Kemp, having nothing more to say, continued her supper in silence. It was Liza who spoke next. There's some new people moved in the street. Have you seen them? she asked. No. What are they? I don't know. I've seen a chap. A big chap with a beard. I think he lives up at the other end. She felt herself blushing a little. No one any good, you be sure, said Mrs Kemp. I can't swallow these new people as are coming in. The street ain't what it was when I first come. When they had done, Mrs Kemp got up, and having finished her half pint of beer, said to her daughter, Put the things away, Liza. I'm just going round to see Mrs Clayton. She's just had twins. She had nine before these come. It's a pity the Lord don't see fit to take some on em. That's what I say. After which pious remark, Mrs Kemp went out of the house and turned into another a few doors up. Liza did not clear the supper things away as she was told, but opened the window and drew her chair to it. She leant on the sill, looking out into the street. The sun had set, and it was twilight. The sky was growing dark, bringing to view the twinkling stars. There was no breeze, but it was pleasantly and restfully cool. The good folks still sat at their doorsteps, talking as before on the same inexhaustible subjects, but a little subdued with the approach of night. The boys were still playing cricket, but they were mostly at the other end of the street, and their shouts were muffled before they reached Liza's ears. She sat, leaning her head on her hands, breathing in the fresh air and feeling a certain exquisite sense of peacefulness which she was not used to. It was Saturday evening, and she thankfully remembered that there would be no factory on the morrow. She was glad to rest. Somehow she felt a little tired. Perhaps it was through the excitement of the afternoon. She enjoyed the quietness of the evening. It seemed so tranquil and still. The silence filled her with a strange delight. She felt as if she could sit there all through the night, looking out into the cool, dark street and up heavenwards at the stars. She was very happy, but yet at the same time experienced a strange new sensation of melancholy, and she almost wished to cry. Suddenly, a dark form stepped in front of the open window. She gave a little shriek. Who's that? she asked, for it was quite dark, and she did not recognise the man standing in front of her. Me, Liza, was the answer. Tom? Yes. It was a young man with light yellow hair and a little fair moustache, which made him appear almost boyish. He was light-complexioned and blue-eyed, and had a frank and pleasant look, mingled with a curious bashfulness that made him blush when people spoke to him. What's up? asked Liza. Come out for a walk, Liza, will you? No, she answered decisively. You promised to yesterday, Liza. Yesterday and today's two different things, was her wise reply. Yes, come on, Liza. Now, nah, I tell you, I won't. I want to talk to you, Liza. Her hand was resting on the window sill, and he put his upon it. She quickly drew it back. Well, I don't want you to talk to me. But she did, for it was she who broke the silence. Say, Tom, who are them new folk as has come into the street? It's a big chap with a brown beard. Do you mean the bloke has kissed you this afternoon? Liza blushed again. But why shouldn't he kiss me? She said, with some inconsequence. I never said as how he shouldn't. I only asked her if it was the same. Yeah, that's who I mean. His name is Blakeston. Jim Blakeston. I've only spoken to him once. He's took the two top rooms at number 19 house. What's he want the two top rooms for? Him? Oh, he's got a big family. Five kids. Ain't you seen his wife about the street? She's a big fat woman, as does her hair funny. I didn't know he had a wife. There was another silence. Liza sat thinking, and Tom stood at the window, looking at her. Won't you come out with me, Liza? he asked at last. Nah, Tom, she said a little more gently. It's too late. Liza, he said, blushing to the roots of his hair. Well? Liza. He couldn't go on and stuttered in the shyness. Liza, I, I, I loves you, Liza. 
gone away. He was quite brave now and took hold of her hand. You know, Liza, I'm earning 23 shillings at the works now, and I've got some furniture as my mother left me when she was took. The girl said nothing. Liza, will you have me? I'll make you a good husband. Liza, swap me, Bob, I will. And you know I'm not a drinking sort. Liza, will you marry me? No, nah, Tom, she answered quietly. Oh, Liza, won't you have me? No, nah, Tom, I can't. Why not? You've come out walking with me ever since Whitson. Ah, uh, things is different now. You're not walking out with anybody else, are you, Liza? He asked quickly. Nah, not that. Well, why won't you, Liza? Oh, Liza, I do love you. I've never loved anybody as I love you. Oh, I can't, Tom. There ain't no one else. Nah. Then why not? I'm very sorry, Tom, but I don't love you so as to marry you. Oh, Liza. She could not see the look upon his face, but she heard the agony in his voice, and moved with sudden pity. She bent out, threw her arms round his neck, and kissed him on both cheeks. Never mind, old chap, she said. I'm not worth troubling about. Quickly drawing back, she slammed the window to, and moved into the further part of the room. End of chapter 2「Eliza of Lambeth」by W. Somerset Maugham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by blogdelacanzen.wordpress.com The following day was Sunday. Liza, when she was dressing herself in the morning, felt the hardness of fate and the impossibility of eating one's cake and having it. She wished she had reserved her new dress, and had still before her the sensation of a first appearance in it. With a sigh, she put on her ordinary, everyday working dress, and proceeded to get the breakfast ready for her mother, who had been out late the previous night, celebrating the new arrivals in the street, and had the rheumatics this morning. "'Oh, my head!' she was saying, as she pressed her hands on each side of her forehead. "'I've got the neuralgia again. What shall I do? I don't know how it is, but it always comes on Sunday mornings. Ooh, and my rheumatics, they give me sitch a doing in the night.' You'd better go to hospital, mother. Not I, answered the worthy lady with great decision. You was a dozen young chaps messing you about and looking at you, and then they tells you to leave off the beer and spirits. Well, what I says? I says I can't do without my glass of beer. She thumped her pillow to emphasise the statement. What with the work I have to do, looking after you, and the cooking, and getting everything ready, and doing all the housework, and going out charring besides? Well, I says, if I don't have a drop of beer, I says... To pull me together, I shall be under the turf in no time. She munched her bread and butter and drank her tea. When you've done breakfast, Liza, she said, you can give the grate a cleaning and my boots would do with a bit of polishing. Mrs Tyke in the new house will give you some blacking. She remained silent for a bit, then said, I don't think I shall get up today, Liza. My rheumatics is bad. You can put the room straight and cook the dinner. All right, mother. You stay where you are and I'll do everything for you. Well, it's only what you ought to do, considering all the trouble you've been to me when you was young, and considering that when you was born, the doctor thought I should never get through it. What have you done with your week's money, Liza? Oh, I've put it away, answered Liza quietly. Where? asked her mother. Where it'll be safe. Where's that? Liza was driven into a corner. Why do you want to know? she asked. Why shouldn't I know? Do you think I want to steal it from you? Nah, not that. Well, why won't you tell me? Oh, things safer when only one person knows where it is. This was a very discreet remark, but it set Mrs. Kemp in a whirlwind of passion. She raised herself and sat up in the bed, flourishing her clenched fist at her daughter. I know what you mean, you. You. Her language was emphatic, her epithets picturesque, but too forcible for reproduction. You think I'd steal it, she went on. I know you. Do you think I'd go and take your dirty money? Well, mother, said Liza, when I've told you before... The money's perspired like. What do you mean? It got less. Well, I can't help that, can I? Anyone can come in here and take the money. If it's hidden away, the they can't, can they, mother? Said Liza. Mrs. Kemp shook her fist. You dirty slut, you, she said. You think I'll take your money? Why, you ought to give it to me every week instead of saving it up and spending it on all sorts of muck while I have to grind my very bones down to keep you. You know, mother, if I didn't have a little bit saved up, we should be rather short when you're down in your luck. 
Mrs. Kemp's money always ran out on Tuesday, and Liza had to keep things going till the following Saturday. "'I don't talk to me,' proceeded Mrs. Kemp. "'When I was a girl, I give all my money to my mother. "'She never had to ask for nothing. "'On Saturday, when I come home with my wages, "'I give it her every farming. "'That's what a daughter ought to do. "'I can say this for myself. "'Behaved by my mother like a gal should. "'None of your prodigal sons for me. "'She didn't have to ask me for three a pence "'to get a drop of beer. "'Liza was wise in her generation. "'She held her tongue and put on her hat. "'Now you're going out and leaving me. "'I don't know what you get to in the street. "'No good, I'll be bound. "'And here am I, left alone. "'And I might die for all you care.' "'In her sorrow at herself, the old lady began to cry, "'and Liza slipped out of the room and into the street. "'Leaning against the wall of the opposite house was Tom. "'He came towards her. "'Hello, she said as she saw him. "'What are you doing here?' "'I was waiting for you to come out, Liza,' he answered. "'She looked at him quickly.' I ain't coming out with you today, if that's what you mean, she said. I never thought of asking you, Liza, after what you said to me last night. His voice was a little sad, and she felt so sorry for him. But you did want to speak to me, didn't you, Tom, she said, more gently. You've got a day off tomorrow, ain't you? Bank holiday, yes. Why? Why, because they've got a drag starting from the Red Lion that's going down to Chingford for the day, and I'm going. Yes, she said. He looked at her doubtfully. Will you come too, Liza? It'll be a regular beano. There's only going to be people in the street. Eh, Liza? No, I can't. Why not? I ain't got it. I ain't got the oofdish. I mean, why don't you come with me? No, Tom, thank you. I can't do that neither. You might as well, Liza. It wouldn't hurt you. No, it wouldn't be right. I can't come out with you and then mean nothing. It would be doing you out of an outing. I don't see why, he said, very crestfallen. I can't go on keeping company with you after what I said last night. I shan't enjoy it a bit without you, Liza. You get somebody else, Tom. You'll do without me all right. She nodded to him and walked up the street to the house of her friend Sally. Having arrived in front of it, she put her hands to her mouth in trumpet form and shouted, Oi, 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 Sally. A couple of fellows standing by copied her. Oi, 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 Sally. Gone, said Liza, looking round at them. Sally did not appear, and she repeated her call. The men imitated her, and half a dozen took it up, so that there was enough noise to wake the seven sleepers. Ay, 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 Sally! Her head was put out of a top window, and Liza, taking off her hat, waved it, crying, Come on down, Sally! All right, old gal, shouted the other. I'm coming. So's Christmas, was Liza's repartee. There was a clatter down the stairs, and Sally, rushing through the passage, threw herself onto her friend. They began fooling, in reminiscence of a melodrama they had lately seen together. Oh, my darling duck, said Liza, kissing her, and pressing her with affected rapture to her bosom. My sweet as sweet, replied Sally, copying her. And how does your ladyship today? Oh, with immense languor, first class, and is your royal highness quite well? I deeply regret, answered Liza, but my royal highness has got the collie wobbles. Sally was a small, thin girl, with sandy hair and blue eyes, and a very freckled complexion. She had an enormous mouth with terrible square teeth set wide apart, which looked as if they could masticate an iron bar. She was dressed like Liza, in a shortish black skirt, and an old-fashioned bodice, green and grey, and yellow with age. Her sleeves were tucked up to the elbow, and she wore a singularly dirty apron that had once been white. "'What have you got your hair in them things for?' asked Liza, pointing to the curl papers. Going out with your young man today? No, I'm going to stay here all day. What for, then? Why, Harry's going to take me to Shingford tomorrow. Oh, in the Red Lion break? Yes. Are you going? Nah. Not? Well, why don't you get round Tom? He'll take you. And jolly glad he'll be, too. He asked me to go with him, but I wouldn't. Sort me, Bob, why not? I ain't keeping company with him. You might have gone with him all the same. Nah, you're going with Harry, ain't you? Yes. And you're going to have him? Right again. Well, I couldn't go with Tom and then throw him over. Well, you are a mug. The two girls had strolled down towards the Westminster Bridge Road, and Sally, meeting her young man, had gone to him. Liza walked back, wishing to get home in time to cook the dinner. She went slowly, but she knew every dweller in the street, and as she passed the group sitting at their doors, as on the previous evening, 
but this time mostly engaged in peeling potatoes or shelling peas, she stopped and had a little chat. Everyone liked her and was glad to have her company. Good old Liza, they would say, as she left them. She's a rare good sort, ain't she? She asked after the aches and pains of all the old people, and delicately inquired after the babies, past and future. The children hung on to her skirts and asked her to play with them, and she would hold one end of the rope while tiny little ragged girls skipped, invariably entangling themselves after two jumps. She had very nearly reached home when she heard a voice cry, Morning! She looked round and recognised the man whom Tom had told her was called Jim Blakeston. He was sitting on a stool at the door of one of the houses, playing with two young children, to whom he was giving rides on his knee. She remembered his heavy brown beard from the day before, and she had also an impression of great size. She noticed this morning that he was, in fact, a big man, tall and broad, and she saw besides that he had large masculine features and pleasant brown eyes. She supposed him to be about forty. Morning, he said again, as she stopped and looked at him. Well, you needn't look as if I was going to eat you up, because I ain't, he said. Who are you? I'm not afraid of you. What are you so blooming red about? he asked pointedly. Well, I'm off. You ain't shirty because I kissed you last night. I'm not shirty, but it was pretty cool, considering like as I didn't know you. Well, you ran into my arms. That I didn't. You ran out and caught me. And kissed you before you could say Jack Robinson. He laughed at the thought. Well, Liza, he went on, seeing as how I kissed you against your will, the best thing you can do to make it up is to kiss me not against your will. Me, said Liza, looking at him open-mouthed. Well, you are a pill. The children began to clamour for the riding, which had been discontinued on Liza's approach. Are them your kids? she asked. Yes, them two's on them. How many have you got? Five. The eldest gal's fifteen, and the next one, who's a boy's twelve. And then there are these two, and baby. Well, you've got enough for your money. Too many for me, and more coming. Oh, well, said Liza, laughing. That's your fault, ain't it? Then she bade him good morning and strolled off. He watched her as she went and saw half a dozen little boys surround her and beg her to join them in their game of cricket. They caught hold of her arms and skirts and pulled her to their pitch. No, I can't, she said, trying to disengage herself. I've got the dinner to cook. Dinner to cook, shouted one small boy. Why, they always cooks the cat's meat at the shop. You little so-and-so, said Liza, somewhat inelegantly, making a dash at him. He dodged her and gave a whoop, then turning, he caught her round the legs, and another boy, catching hold of her round the neck, they dragged her down, and all three struggled on the ground, running over and over. The other boys threw themselves on top, so that there was a great heap of arms and legs and heads, waving and bobbing up and down. Liza extricated herself with some difficulty, and taking off her hat, she began cuffing the boys with it, using all the time the most lively expressions. Then, having cleared the field, she retired victorious into her own house and began cooking the dinner. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of Liza of Lambert by W. Somerset Maugham This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hatton43, blog de la quinzaine.wordpress.com Bank holiday was a beautiful day. The cloudless sky threatened a stifling heat for noontide, but early in the morning, when Liza got out of bed and threw open the window, it was fresh and cool. She dressed herself, wondering how she should spend her day. She thought of Sally going off to Chingford with her lover, and of herself remaining alone in the dull street with half the people away. She almost wished it were an ordinary work day, and that there were no such things as bank holidays, and it seemed to be a little like two Sundays running, but with the second rather worse than the first. Her mother was still sleeping, and she was in no great hurry about getting the breakfast, but stood quietly, looking out of the window at the house opposite. In a little while she saw Sally coming along. She was arrayed in purple and fine linen, a very smart red dress, trimmed with velveteen, and a tremendous hat covered with feathers. She had reaped the benefit of keeping her hair in curl papers since Saturday, and her sandy fringe stretched from ear to ear. She was in enormous spirits. Hello, Eliza, she called as soon as she saw her at the window. Eliza looked at her a little enviously. Hello, she answered quietly. I'm just going to the Red Lion to meet Harry. At what time do you start? The break leaves at half past eight sharp. Why, it's only eight. It's just struck at the church. 
Harry won't be there yet, will he? Oh, he's sure to be early. I couldn't wait. I've been witting about since half past six. I've been up since five this morning. Since five? What have you been doing? Dressing myself and doing my hair. I woke up so early. I've been dreaming all the night about it. I simply couldn't sleep. Well, you are a caution, said Liza. Bust it. I don't go on the spree every day. Oh, I do hope I shall enjoy myself. Why, you simply don't know where you are, said Liza, a little crossly. Don't you wish you was coming, Liza? asked Sally. Nah, I could if I liked, but I don't want her. You are a cough drop, that's all I can say. Catch me refusing when I have the chance. Well, it's done now. I ain't got the chance any more. Liza said this with just a little regret in her voice. Come on down to the Red Lion, Liza, and see us off, said Sally. No, I'm damned if I do, answered Liza with some warmth. You might as well. Perhaps Harry won't be there, and you can keep me company till he comes, and you can see the horses. Liza was really very anxious to see the break, and the horses, and the people going, but she hesitated a little longer. Sally asked her once again, then she said, All right, I'll come with you, and wait till the blooming old thing starts. She did not trouble to put on a hat, but just walked down as she was, and accompanied Sally to the public house, which was getting up the expedition. Although there was still nearly half an hour to wait, the brake was drawn up before the main entrance. It was large and long, with seats arranged crosswise, so that four people could sit on each, and it was drawn by two powerful horses, whose harness the coachman was now examining. Sally was not the first on the scene, for already half a dozen people had taken their places, but Harry had not yet arrived. The two girls stood by the public door, looking at the preparations. Huge baskets full of food were brought out and stowed away. Cases of beer were hoisted up and put in every possible place, under the seats, under the driver's legs, and even beneath the brake. As more people came up, Sally began to get excited about Harry's non-appearance. I say, I wish he'd come, she said. He is late. Then she looked up and down the Westminster Bridge Road to see if he was in view. Suppose he don't turn up, I will give it him when he comes for keeping me witting like this. Why, there's a quarter of an hour yet, said Liza, who saw nothing at all to get excited about. At last, Sally saw her lover and rushed off to meet him. Liza was left alone, rather disconsolate at all this bustle and preparation. She was not sorry that she had refused Tom's invitation, but she did wish that she had conscientiously been able to accept it. Sally and her friend came up, attired in his Sunday best. He was a fit match for his lady love. He wore a shirt and collar, unusual luxuries, and be carried under his arm a concertina to make things merry on the way. "'Ain't you going, Liza?' he asked in surprise at seeing her without a hat and with her apron on. "'Nah,' said Sally. "'Ain't she as soft? Tom said he'd take her and she wouldn't. Well, I'm dashed.' Then they climbed the ladder and took their seats, so that Liza was left alone again. More people had come along, and the break was nearly full. Liza knew them all, but they were too busy taking their places to talk to her. At last Tom came. He saw her standing there and went up to her. Won't you change your mind, Liza, and come along with us? Nah, Tom, I told you I wouldn't. It's not right, like. She felt she must repeat that to herself often. I shan't enjoy it a bit without you, he said. Well, I can't help it, she answered somewhat sullenly. At that moment, a man came out of the public house with a horn in his hand. Her heart gave a great jump, for if there was anything she adored, it was to drive along to the tooting of a horn. She really felt it was very hard lines that she must stay at home when all these people were going to have such a fine time and they were all so merry. She could picture to herself so well the delights of the drive and the picnic. She felt very much inclined to cry, but she mustn't go, and she wouldn't go. She repeated that to herself twice as the trumpeter gave a preliminary tootle. Two more people hurried along, and when they came near, Liza saw that they were Jim Blakeston and a woman whom she supposed to be his wife. Are you coming, Liza? Jim said to her. No, she answered. I didn't know you was going. I wish she was coming, he replied. We shall have a game. She could only just keep back the sobs. She so wished she were going. It did seem hard that she must remain behind, and all because she wasn't going to marry Tom. After all, she didn't see why that should prevent her. There really was no need to refuse for that. She began to think she had acted foolishly. It didn't do anyone any good that she refused to go out with Tom and no one thought it anything specially fine that she should renounce her pleasure. Sally merely thought her a fool. Tom was standing by his side, silent, and looking disappointed and rather unhappy. 
Jim said to her in a low voice, I am sorry you're not coming. It was too much. She did want to go so badly, and she really couldn't resist any longer. If Tom would only ask her once more, and if she could only change her mind reasonably and decently, she would accept. But he stood silent, and she had to speak herself. It was very undignified. You know, Tom, she said, I don't want to spoil your day. Well, I don't think I should go alone. It'd be so precious slow. Supposing he didn't ask her again, what should she do? She looked up at the clock on the front of the pub and noticed that it only wanted five minutes to the half hour. How terrible it would be if the break started and he didn't ask her. Her heart beat violently against her chest, and in her agitation she fumbled with the corner of her apron. Well, what can I do, Tom dear? Why, come with me, of course. Oh, Liza, do say yes. She had got the offer again, and had only wanted a little seemly hesitation, and the thing was done. I should like to, Tom, she said. But do you, do you think it'd be all right? Yes, of course it would. Come on, Liza. In his eagerness, he clasped her hand. Well, she remarked, looking down, if it'd spoil your holiday. I won't go if you don't. Swap me, Bob, I won't, he answered. Well, if I come, it won't mean that I'm keeping company with you. Nah, it won't mean anything if you don't like. All right, she said. You'll come? He could hardly believe her. Yes, she answered, smiling all over her face. You're a good sort, Liza, I say. Harry, Liza's coming, he shouted. Liza, hooray, shouted Harry. Sat right, Liza, called Sally. And Liza, feeling quite joyful and light of heart, called back, yes. Hooray, shouted Sally in answer. That's right, Liza, called Jim, and he smiled pleasantly as she looked at him. There's just room for you two here, said Harry, pointing to the vacant places by his side. All right, said Tom, I must just go and get a hat. And tell mother, said Liza. There's just three minutes. Be quick, answered Tom. And as she scampered off as hard as she could go, he shouted to the coachman. Old oh lard, there's another passenger coming in a minute. All right, old cock, answered the coachman. No hurry. Liza rushed into the room and called to her mother, who was still asleep. Mother, mother, I'm going to Chingford. Then tearing off her old dress, she slipped into her gorgeous violet one. She kicked off her old ragged shoes and put on her new boots. She brushed her hair down and rapidly gave her fringe a twirl and a twist. It was luckily still moderately in curl from the previous Saturday, and putting on her black hat with all the feathers, she rushed along the street, and scrambling up the brake steps, fell panting on Tom's lap. The coachman cracked his whip, the trumpeter tooted his horn, and with a cry and a cheer from the occupants, the brake clattered down the road. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Liza of Lambeth by W. Somerset Maugham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hatton forty three, blog de la quinzaine dot wordpress dot com. As soon as Liza had recovered herself, she started examining the people on the brake, and first of all she took stock of the woman whom Jim Blakeston had with him. This is my missus, said Jim, pointing to her with his thumb. You ain't been down in the street much, have you? said Liza by way of making the acquaintance. Nah, answered Mrs. Blakeston. My youngster's been down with the measles, and I've had my work cut out looking after him. Oh, and is he all right now? Yes, he's getting on fine, and Jim wants to go to Chingford today, and he says to me, well, he says, you come along to Chingford too, it'll do you good. And he says, you can leave Polly, she's my eldest, you know, you can leave Polly, says he, to look after the kids. So I says, well, I don't mind if I do, says I. Meanwhile, Liza was looking at her. First, she noticed her dress. She wore a black coat and a funny, old-fashioned black bonnet. Then, examining the woman herself, she saw a middle-sized, stout person anywhere between thirty and forty years old. She had a large, fat face with a big mouth, and her hair was curiously parted in the middle and plastered down on each side of the head in little plaits. One could see that she was a woman of great strength, notwithstanding evident traces of hard work and much childbearing. Liza knew all the other passengers, and now that everyone was settled down and had got over the excitement of departure, they had time to greet one another. They were delighted to have Liza among them, for where she was there was no dullness. Her attention was first of all taken up by a young coster, who had arrayed himself in the traditional costume, grey suit, 
tight trousers and shiny buttons in profusion. "'What cheer, Bill?' she cried to him. "'What cheer, Liza?' he answered. "'You are got up, Dossie. You'll knock em. "'Now then, Liza Kemp,' said his companion, turning round with mock indignation. "'You let my Johnny alone. If you come getting round him, I'll give you what for.' "'All right, Clary Sharp. I don't want him,' answered Liza. "'I've got one of my own, and that's a good handful, ain't it, Tom?' Tom was delighted, and, unable to find a repartee, in his pleasure, gave Liza a great nudge with his elbow. "'Ooh, I say,' said Liza, putting her hand to her side. "'Take care of my ribs. You'll break em. "'Them's not your ribs,' shouted a candid friend. "'Them's your whale bones you're afraid of breaking. "'Gone!' "'Have you got whale bones?' said Tom, with affected simplicity, putting his arm round her waist to feel. "'Now then,' she said, "'keep off the grass.' "'Well, I only wanted to know if you'd got any.' "'Gone. You don't get round me like that.' He still kept as he was. "'Now then,' she repeated, "'take your hand away. If you touch me there, you'll have to marry me.' "'That's just what I wants to do, Liza.' "'Shut it,' she answered cruelly, and drew his arm away from her waist. The horses scampered on, and the man behind blew his horn with vigour. "'Don't bust yourself, Governor,' said one of the passengers to him, when he made a particularly discordant sound. They drove along eastwards, and, as the hour grew later, the streets became more filled and the traffic greater. At last they got on the road to Chingford, and caught up numbers of other vehicles going in the same direction. Donkey chaises, pony carts, tradesmen's carts, dog carts, drags, brakes, every conceivable kind of wheel thing, all filled with people. The wretched donkey dragging along four solid ratepayers to the pair of stout horses, easily managing a couple of score. They exchanged cheers and greetings as they passed, the red lion break being noticeable above all for its uproariousness. As the day wore on, the sun became hotter, and the road seemed more dusty and threw up a greater heat. I am get not, was the common cry, and everyone began to puff and sweat. The ladies removed their cloaks and capes, and the men, following their example, took off their coats and sat in their shirt sleeves whereupon ensued much banter of a not particularly edifying kind, respecting the garments which each person would like to remove, which showed that the innuendo of French farce is not so unknown to the upright, honest Englishman as might be supposed. At last came in sight the halfway house, where the horses were to have a rest and a sponge down. They had been talking of it for the last quarter mile, and when at length it was observed on top of a hill, a cheer broke out, and some thirsty wag began to sing Rule Britannia, whilst others burst forth with a different national ditty, Beer, Glorious Beer. They drew up before the pub entrance, and all climbed down as quickly as they could. The bar was besieged, and potmen and barmaids were quickly busy drawing beer and handing it over to the eager folk outside. The Idyll of Corydon and Phyllis Gallantry ordered that the faithful swain and the amorous shepherdess should drink out of one and the same pot. "'Hurry up and have your whack,' said Corydon, politely handing the foaming bowl for his fair one to drink from. Phyllis, without replying, raised it to her lips and drank deep. The swain watched anxiously. "'Here, give us a chance,' he said, as the pot was raised higher and higher, and its contents appeared to be getting less and less." At this, the amorous shepherdess stopped and handed the pot to her lover. "'Well, I'm dashed,' said Corydon, looking into it, and added, "'I guess you know a thing or two. Then, with courtly grace, putting his own lips to the place where had been those of his beloved, finished the pint. "'Golummy!" remarked the shepherdess, smacking her lips. "'That was something like!' And she put out her tongue and licked her lips, and then breathed deeply. The faithful swain, having finished, gave a long sigh and said, Well, I could do with some more. For the matter of that, I could do with a gargle. Thus encouraged, the gallant returned to the bar and soon brought out a second pint. You have first pop, amorously remarked Phyllis, and he took a long drink and handed the pot to her. She, with maiden modesty, turned it so as to have a different part to drink from, but he remarked as he saw her, you are bloomin' particular. Then, unwilling to grieve him, she turned it back again and applied her ruby lips to the place where his had been. Now we shan't be long, she remarked as she handed him back the pot. The faithful swain took out of his pocket a short clay pipe, blew through it, filled it, 
and began to smoke, while Phyllis sighed at the thought of the cool liquid gliding down her throat, and with the pleasing recollection gently stroked her stomach. Then Corydon spat, and immediately his love said, I can spit farther than that. I bet you can't. She tried and did. He collected himself and spat again, further than before. She followed him, and in this idyllic contest they remained till the tootling horn warned them to take their places. At last they reached Chingford, and here the horses were taken out and the drag, on which they were to lunch, drawn up in a sheltered spot. They were all rather hungry, but as it was not yet feeding time, they scattered to have drinks meanwhile. Liza and Tom, with Sally and her young man, went off together to the nearest public house, and as they drank beer, Harry, who was a great sportsman, gave them a graphic account of a prize fight he had seen on the previous Saturday evening, which had been rendered specially memorable by one man being so hurt that he had died from the effects. It had evidently been a very fine affair, and Harry said that several swells from the West End had been present, and he related their ludicrous efforts to get in without being seen by anyone and their terror when someone to frighten them called out, Copper! Then Tom and he entered into a discussion on the subject of boxing, in which Tom, being a shy and undogmatic sort of person, was entirely worsted. After this, they strolled back to the break, and found things being prepared for luncheon. The hampers were brought out and emptied, and the bottles of beer in great profusion made many a thirsty mouth thirstier. "'Come along, ladies and gentlemen, if you are gentlemen,' shouted the coachman. "'The animals is now going to be fed.' "'Gone away,' answered somebody. "'We're not animals. We don't drink water.' "'You're too clever,' remarked the coachman. "'I can see you've just come from the board school.' As the former speaker was a lady of quite mature appearance, the remark was not without its little irony. The other man blew his horn by way of grace, at which Liza called out to him, "'Don't do that. You'll bust. I know you will.' and if you bust, you'll quite spoil my dinner. Then they all set to. Pork pies, saveloys, sausages, cold potatoes, hard-boiled eggs, cold bacon, veal, ham, crabs and shrimps, cheese, butter, cold suet puddings and treacle, gooseberry tarts, cherry tarts, butter, bread, more sausages, and yet again pork pies. They devoured the provisions like ravening beasts, stolidly, silently, earnestly, in large mouthfuls which they shoved down their throats unmasticated. The intelligent foreigner, seeing them thus dispose of their food, would have understood why England is a great nation. He would have understood why Britons never, never will be slaves. They never stopped except to drink, and then at each gulp they emptied their glasses, no heel taps, and still they ate, and still they drank, but as all things must cease, they stopped at last, and a long sigh of content broke from their two-and-thirty throats. Then the gathering broke up, and the good folk paired themselves and separated. Harry and his lady strolled off to secluded byways in the forest, so that they might discourse of their loves and digest their dinner. Tom had all morning been waiting for this happy moment. He had counted on the expansive effect of a full stomach to thaw his Liza's coldness and he had pictured himself sitting on the grass with his back against the trunk of a spreading chestnut tree, with his arm round Liza's waist, and her head resting affectionately on his manly bosom. Liza, too, had foreseen the separation into couples after dinner, and had been racking her brains to find a means of getting out of it. "'I don't want him slobbering about me,' she said. "'It gives me the sick, all this kissing and cuddling.' She scarcely knew why she objected to his caresses but they bored her and made her cross. But luckily, the blessed institution of marriage came to her rescue, for Jim and his wife naturally had no particular desire to spend the afternoon together, and Liza, seeing a little embarrassment on their part, proposed that they should go for a walk together in the forest. Jim agreed at once, and with pleasure, but Tom was dreadfully disappointed. He hadn't the courage to say anything, but he glared at Blakeston. Jim smiled benignly at him, and Tom began to sulk. Then they began a funny walk through the woods. Jim tried to go on with Liza, and Liza was not at all disinclined to this, for she had come to the conclusion that Jim, notwithstanding his cheek, was not half a bad sort. But Tom kept walking alongside of them, and as Jim slightly quickened his pace so as to get Liza on in front, Tom quickened his, 
and Mrs. Blakeston, who didn't want to be left behind, had to break into a little trot to keep up with them. Jim tried also to get Liza all to himself in the conversation, and let Tom see that he was out in the cold, but Tom would break in with cross, sulky remarks, just to make the others uncomfortable. Liza at last got rather vexed with him. "'Strokes me you got out of bed the wrong way this morning,' she said to him. "'He didn't think that when he said he'd come out with me,' he emphasised the me. Liza shrugged her shoulders. "'You give me the ump,' she said. "'If you wants to make a fool of yourself, you can go elsewhere and do it.' "'I suppose you want me to go away now,' he said angrily. "'I didn't say I did.' "'All right, Liza. I won't stay where I'm not wanted.' And turning on his heel, he marched off, striking through the underwood into the midst of the forest. He felt extremely unhappy as he wandered on, and there was a choky feeling in his throat as he thought of Liza. She was very unkind and ungrateful, and he wished he had never come to Chingford. She might so easily have come for a walk with him, instead of going with that beast of a Blakeston. She wouldn't ever do anything for him, and he hated her. But all the same, he was a poor, foolish thing in love, and he began to feel that perhaps he had been a little exacting and a little forward to take offence. And then he wished he had never said anything, and he wanted so much to see her and make it up. He made his way back to Chingford, hoping she would not make him wait too long. Liza was a little surprised when Tom turned and left them. "'What has he got the needle about?' she said. "'Why, he's jealous,' answered Jim with a laugh. "'Tom, jealous? Yes, he's jealous of me.' "'Well, he ain't got no cause to be jealous of anyone.' "'That he ain't,' said Liza, and continued by telling him all about Tom, how he had wanted to marry her, and how she wouldn't have him, and how she had only agreed to come to Chingford with him, on the understanding that she should preserve her entire freedom. Jim listened sympathetically, but his wife paid no attention. She was doubtless engaged in thought respecting her household or her family. When they got back to Chingford, they saw Tom standing in solitude looking at Liza was struck by the woe-begone expression on his face. She felt she had been cruel to him, and leaving the Blakestons went up to him. "'I say, Tom,' she said, "'don't take on so. I didn't mean it.' He was bursting to apologise for his behaviour. "'You know, Tom,' she went on, "'I'm rather hasty, and I'm sorry I said what I did.' "'Oh, Liza, you are good. You ain't cross with me.' "'Me? Nah, it's you that ought to be cross. "'You are a good sort, Liza.' You ain't vexed with me. Give me Liza every time, that's what I say, he answered as his face lit up. Come along and have tea, and then we'll go for a donkey ride. The donkey ride was a great success. Liza was a little afraid at first, so Tom walked by her side to take care of her. She screamed at the moment the beast began to trot, and clutched hold of Tom to save herself from falling. And as he felt her hand on his shoulder and heard her appealing cry, Oh, do hold me, I'm falling! He felt that he had never in his life been so deliciously happy. The whole party joined in, and it was proposed that they should have races. But in the first heat, when the donkeys broke into a canter, Liza fell off into Tom's arms, and the donkeys scampered on without her. "'I'll know what I'll do,' she said, when the runaway had been recovered. "'I'll ride him straddly-wise.' "'Go on,' said Sally. "'You can't with petticoats.' "'Yes, I can, and I will do.' So another donkey was procured this time with a man's saddle. Putting her foot in the stirrup, she cocked her leg over and took her seat triumphantly. Neither modesty nor bashfulness was to be reckoned among Liza's faults, and in this position she felt quite at ease. "'I'll get along all right now, Tom,' she said. "'You go on and get yourself a mo and come and join in.' The next race was perfectly uproarious. Liza kicked and beat her donkey with all her might, shrieking and laughing the white and finally came in winner by a length. After that, they felt rather warm and dry, and repaired to the public house to restore themselves and talk over the excitements of the racecourse. When they had drunk several pints of beer, Liza and Sally, their respective adorers and the Blakestons, walked round to find another means of amusing themselves. They were arrested by a coconut shy. "'Oh, let's have a shy,' said Liza excitedly, at which the unlucky men had to pull out their coppers, while Sally and Liza made ludicrously bad shots at the coconuts. "'It looks so bloomin' easy,' said Liza, brushing up her hair. "'But I can't hit the blasted thing. You have a shot, Tom.' He and Harry were equally unskilful. 
but Jim got three coconuts running, and the proprietors of the show began to look on him with some concern. You are a dab at it, said Liza in admiration. They tried to induce Mrs. Blakeston to try her luck, but she stoutly refused. I don't hold with such foolishness. It's waste of money to me, she said. Now then, don't crack on, old tart, remarked her husband. Let's go and eat the coconuts. There was one for each couple, and after the ladies had sucked the juice, they divided them and added their respective shares to their dinners and teas. Supper came next. Again, they fell to sausage rolls, boiled eggs and saveloys, and countless bottles of beer were added to those already drunk. I don't know how many bottles of beer I've drunk. I've lost count, said Liza, whereat there was a general laugh. They still had an hour before the break was to start back, and it was then the concertinas came in useful. They sat down on the grass, and the concert was begun by Harry, who played a solo. Then there was a call for a song, and Jim stood up and sang that ancient ditty, O oh, Dem Golden Kippers O. Oh. There was no shyness in the company, and Liza, almost without being asked, gave another popular comic song. Then there was more concertina playing, and another demand for a song. Liza turned to Tom, who was sitting quietly by her side. Give us a song, old cock, she said. I can't, he answered. I'm not a singing sort. At which Blakeston got up and offered to sing again. Tom is rather a soft, said Liza to herself. Not like that cove, Blakeston. They repaired to the public house to have a few last drinks before the break started, and when the horn blew to warn them, rather unsteadily, they proceeded to take their places. Liza, as she scrambled up the steps, said, Well, I believe I'm boozed. The coachman had arrived at the melancholy stage of intoxication, and was sitting on his box holding his reins, with his head bent on his chest. He was thinking sadly of the long-lost days of his youth, and wishing he had been a better man. Liza had no respect for such holy emotions, and she brought down her fist on the crown of his hat, and bashed it over his eyes. Now then, old Jelly Belly, she said, what's the good of having a face as long as a kite? He turned round and smote her. Jelly Belly yourself, said he. Puddin' face, she cried. Kite face, boss I. She was tremendously excited, laughing and singing, keeping the whole company in an uproar. In her jollity, she had changed hats with Tom and he in her big feathers made her shriek with laughter. When they started, they began to sing, For he's a jolly good fella, making the night resound with their noisy voices. Liza and Tom and the Blakestons had got a seat together, Liza being between the two men. Tom was perfectly happy, and only wished that they might go on so forever. Gradually, as they drove along, they became quieter. Their singing ceased, and they talked in undertones. Some of them slept. Sally and her young man were leaning up against one another, slumbering quite peacefully. The night was beautiful, the sky still blue, very dark, scattered over with countless brilliant stars, and Liza, as she looked up at the heavens, felt a certain emotion, as if she wished to be taken in someone's arms or feel some strong man's caress, and there was in her heart a strange sensation as though it were growing big. She stopped speaking, and all four were silent. Then slowly she felt Tom's arm steal round her waist, cautiously, as though it were afraid of being there. This time both she and Tom were happy. But suddenly there was a movement on the other side of her. A hand was advanced along her leg, and a hand was grasped and gently pressed. It was Jim Blakeston. She started a little and began trembling so that Tom noticed it, and whispered, You're cold, Liza. No, nah, I'm not, Tom. It's only a sort of shiver that went through me. His arm gave her waist a squeeze, and at the same time the big rough hand pressed her little one. And so she sat between them till they reached the red line in the Westminster Bridge Road, and Tom said to himself, I believe she does care for me after all. When they got down they all said good night, and Sally and Liza, with their respective slaves, and the Blakestons, marched off homewards. At the corner of Vere Street, Harry said to Tom and Blakeston, I say, you blokes, let's go and have another drink before closing time. I don't mind, said Tom, after we've took the gals home. Then we shan't have time, it's just on closing time now, answered Harry. Well, we can't leave him here. Yes, you can, said Sally. No one will run away with us. Tom did not want to part from Liza, but she broke in with, 
Yes, go on, Tom. Sally and me will get along all right, and you ain't got too much time. Yes, good night, Harry, said Sally to settle the matter. Good night, old gal, he answered. Give us another slobber. And she, not at all unwilling, surrendered herself to him, while he imprinted two sounding kisses on her cheeks. Good night, Tom, said Liza, holding out her hand. Good night, Liza, he answered, taking it, but looking very wistfully at her. She understood, and with a kindly smile, lifted up her face to him. He bent down, and taking her in his arms, kissed her passionately. You do kiss nice, Liza, he said, making the others laugh. Thanks for taking me out, old man, she said as they parted. All right, Liza, he answered, and added to himself, God bless you. Hello, Blakeston, ain't you coming? said Harry, seeing that Jim was walking off with his wife, instead of joining him and Tom. Nah, he answered, I'm going home. I've got to be up at five tomorrow. You are a chap, said Harry, disgustedly, strolling off with Tom to the pub, while the others made their way down the sleeping street. The house where Sally lived came first, and she left them. Then, walking a few yards more, they came to the Blakestons, and after a little talk at the door, Liza bade the couple good night, and was left to walk the rest of the way home. The street was perfectly silent, and the lampposts far apart, through a dim light, which only served to make Liza realise her solitude. There was such a difference between the street at midday, with its swarms of people, and now, when there was neither sound nor soul besides herself, that even she was struck by it. The regular line of houses on either side, with the even pavements and straight, cemented road, seemed to her like some desert place, as if everyone were dead, or a fire had raged and left it all desolate. Suddenly she heard a footstep. She started and looked back. It was a man hurrying behind her. In a moment she had recognised Jim. He beckoned to her, in a low voice called Liza. She stopped till he had come up to her. What have you come out again for? she said. I've come out to say good night to you, Liza, he answered. But you said good night a moment ago. I wanted to say it again, properly. Where's your missus? Oh, she's gone in. I said I was dry and was going to have a drink after all. But she'll know you didn't go to the pub. No, nah, she won't. She's gone straight upstairs to see after the kid. I wanted to see you alone, Liza. Why? He didn't answer, but he tried to take hold of her hand. She drew it away quickly. They walked in silence till they came to Liza's house. Good night, said Liza. Won't you come for a little walk, Liza? Take care, no one hears you, she added in a whisper, though why she whispered she did not know. Will you? he asked again. Nah, you've got to get up at five. Oh, I only said that not to go into the pub with them. So as you might come here with me, asked Liza. Yes. No, I'm not coming. Good night. Well, say good night nicely. What do you mean? Tom said you did kiss nice. She looked at him without speaking, and in a moment he had clasped his arms round her, almost lifting her off her feet, and kissed her. She turned her face away. Give us your lips, Liza, he whispered. Give us your lips. He turned her face without resistance and kissed her on the mouth. At last she tore herself from him, and opening the door, slid away into the house. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Liza of Lambeth by W. Somerset Maugham This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hatton43, blog de la quinzaine.wordpress.com Next morning, on her way to the factory, Liza came up with Sally. They were both of them rather stale and bedraggled after the day's outing. Their fringes were ragged and untidily straying over their foreheads. Their back hair, carelessly tied in a loose knot, fell over their necks and threatened completely to come down. Liza had not had time to put her hat on and was holding it in her hand. Sally's was pinned on sideways, and she had to bash it down on her head every now and then to prevent its coming off. Cinderella herself was not more transformed than they were, but Cinderella, even in her rags, was virtuously tidy and patched up, while Sally had a great tear in her shabby dress, and Liza's stockings were falling over her boots. "'What cheer, Sal?' said Liza, when she caught her up. 
Oh, I've got such a head on me this morning, she remarked, turning round a pale face, heavily lined under the eyes. I don't feel too chirpy neither, said Liza sympathetically. I wish I hadn't drunk so much beer, added Sally, as a pang shot through her head. Oh, you'll be all right in a bit, said Liza. Just then they heard the clock strike eight. They began to run so they might not miss getting their tokens and thereby their day's pay. They turned into the street at the end of which was the factory and saw half a hundred women running like themselves to get in before it was too late. All the morning Liza worked in a dead and alive sort of fashion, her head like a piece of lead with electric shocks going through it when she moved and her tongue and mouth hot and dry. At last lunchtime came. Come on, Sal, said Liza. I'm going to have a glass of bitter. I can't stand this no longer. So they entered the public house opposite, and in one draught finished their pots. Liza gave a long sigh of relief. That bucks you up, don't it? I was dry. I ain't told you yet, Liza, have I? He got at it last night. What do you mean? Why, Harry, he spit it out at last. Asked you to name the day, said Liza, smiling. That's it. And did you? Didn't I just, answered Sally with some emphasis. I always told you I'd get off before you. Yes, said Liza, thinking. You know, Liza, you better take Tom. He ain't a bad sort. She was quite patronising. I'm going to take who I like, and it ain't nobody's business but mine. All right, Liza, don't get shirty over it. I don't mean no offence. What do you say it for, then? Well, I thought of seeing as you'd gone out with him yesterday that you meant to, after all. He wanted to take me. I didn't ask him. Well, I didn't ask my hair either. I never said you did, replied Liza. Oh, you've got the ump you have, finished Sally rather angrily. The beer had restored Liza. She went back to work without a headache, and except for a slight languor, feeling no worse for the previous day's debauch. As she worked on, she began going over in her mind the events of the preceding day, and she found entwined in all her thoughts the burly person of Jim Blakeston. She saw him walking by her side in the forest, presiding over the meals, playing the concertina, singing, joking, and finally on the drive back, she felt the heavy form by her side, and the big, rough hand holding hers, while Tom's arm was round her waist. Tom! That was the first time he had entered her mind, and he sank into a shadow beside the other. Last of all, she remembered the walk home from the pub, the good nights, the rapid footsteps as Jim caught her up, and the kiss. She blushed and looked up quickly to see whether any of the girls were looking at her. She could not help thinking of that moment when he took her in his arms. She still felt the roughness of his beard pressing on her mouth. Her heart seemed to grow larger in her breast, and she caught for breath as she threw back her head as if to receive his lips again. A shudder ran through her from the vividness of the thought. "'What are you shivering for, Liza?' asked one of the girls. "'You ain't cold.' "'Not much,' answered Liza, blushing awkwardly on her meditations being broken into. "'Why, I'm sweating so. I'm dripping wet. I expect you caught cold in the forest yesterday. I see your mash as I was coming along this morning.' Liza stared a little. "'I ain't got one. Who do you mean, eh? You're only Tom, of course. He did look washed out. What was you doing with him yesterday?' He ain't got nothing to do with me, he ain't. Go on, don't you tell me. The bell rang, and throwing over their work, the girls trooped off, and after chattering in groups outside the factory gates for a while, made their way in different directions to their respective homes. Liza and Sally went along together. I say, we are coming out, cried Sally, seeing the advertisement of a play being acted at the neighbouring theatre. I should like to see that, said Liza, as they stood arm in arm in front of the flaring poster. It represented two rooms and a passage in between. In one room, a dead man was lying on the floor, while two others were standing horror-stricken, listening to a youth who was in the passage, knocking at the door. You see, they've killed him, said Sally excitedly. Yes, any fool can see that. And the one outside, what's he doing of? Ain't he beautiful? I'll get my Harry to take me, I will. I should like to see it. He said he'd take me to the play. They strolled on again, and Liza, leaving Sally, made her way to her mother's. She knew she must pass Jim's house, and wondered whether she would see him. But as she walked along the street, she saw Tom coming the opposite way. With a sudden impulse, she turned back so as not to meet him, 
and began walking the way she had come. Then, thinking herself a fool for what she had done, she turned again and walked towards him. She wondered if she had seen her or noticed her movement, but when she looked down the street, he was nowhere to be seen. He had not caught sight of her, and had evidently gone in to see a mate in one or other of the houses. She quickened her step, and passing the house where Jim lived, could not help looking up. He was standing at the door watching her, with a smile on his lips. "'I didn't see you, Mr. Blakeston,' she said as he came up to her. "'Didn't you? Well, I knew you would, and I was waiting for you to look up. I see you before today. Now, when? I passed behind you as you and that girl was looking at the advertisement of that play. I never seen you. No, I know you didn't. I hear you say, you says, I should like to see that. Yes, and I should too. Well, I'll take you. You? Yes, why not? I like that. What would your missus say? She wouldn't know. But the neighbours would. No, they wouldn't. No one would see us. He was speaking in a low voice so that people could not hear. You could meet me outside the theatre, he went on. No, I couldn't go with you. You're a married man. Gone. What's the matter? Just to go to the play? And besides, my missus can't come if she wanted. She's got the kids to look after. I should like to see it, said Liza meditatively. They'd reached her house, and Jim said, Well, come out this evening and tell me if you will, eh, Liza? Nah, I'm not coming out this evening. That won't hurt you. I shall wait for you. Taint a bit of good you're waiting, cos I shan't come. Well then, look here, Liza. Next Saturday night's the last night, and I shall go to the theatre anyhow. And if you come, you just come to the door at half past six, and you'll find me there. See? No, nah, I don't, said Liza firmly. Well, I shall expect you. I shan't come, so you needn't expect. And with that, she walked into the house and slammed the door behind her. Her mother had not come in from her day's charring and Liza set about getting her tea. She thought it would be rather lonely eating it alone, so pouring out a cup of tea and putting a little condensed milk into it, she cut a huge piece of bread and butter and sat herself down outside on the doorstep. Another woman came downstairs, and seeing Liza, sat down by her side and began to talk. "'Why, Mrs. Stanley, what have you done to your head?' asked Liza, noticing a bandage round her forehead. "'I had an accident last night.' "'answered the woman, blushing uneasily. "'Oh, I am sorry. What did you do to yourself?' "'I fell against the coal scuttle and cut my head open. "'Well, I never. "'To tell you the truth, I had a few words with my old man. "'But one doesn't like them things to get about. "'Won't it tell anyone, will you?' "'Not me,' answered Liza. "'I didn't know your husband was like that.' "'Oh, he's gentle as a lamb when he's sober,' said Mrs. Stanley apologetically. But Lord bless you, when he's had a job too much, he's a demon, and there's no two ways about it. Ain't you been married long neither, said Liza? Nah, not above eighteen months. Ain't it disgraceful? That's what the doctor at the hospital says to me. I had to go to the hospital. You should have seen how it bled. It bled all down my face, and went streaming like a bust water pipe. Well, it there frightened my old man, and I says to him, I'll charge you. And although I was bleeding like a blooming pig, I shook my fist at him, and I says, I'll charge you, see if I don't. And he says, nah, says he, don't do that, for God's sake, Katie, I'll get three months. And serve you damn well right, says I, and I went out and I left him, but Lord bless you, I wouldn't charge him. I know he don't mean it, he's as gentle as a lamb when he's sober. She smiled affectionately as she said this. What did you do then? asked Liza. Well, as I was telling you, I went to the hospital, and the doctor says to me, My good woman, says he, you might have been very seriously injured, and me not been married eighteen months. And as I was telling the doctor all about it, Mrs., he says to me, looking at me straight in the eyeball, Mrs., says he, have you been drinking? Drinking, says I? No, I've had a little drop, but as for drinking, mind, says I, I don't say I'm a teetotaler, I'm not. I've had my glass of beer, and I like it. I couldn't do without it. What with the work I have, I must have something to keep me together. But as for drinking heavily, well, I can say this. There ain't a soberer woman than myself in all London. Why, my first husband never touched a drop. Ah, my first husband. He was a beauty, he was. She stopped the repetition of her conversation, and addressed herself to Liza. 
He was now different to this one. He was a man as had seen better days. He was a gentleman. She mouthed the word and emphasised it with an expressive nod. He was a gentleman and a Christian. He'd been in good circumstances in his time and he was a man of education and a teetotaler for 22 years. At that moment, Liza's mother appeared on the scene. Good evening, Mrs Stanley, she said politely. The same to you, Mrs Kemp, replied that lady with equal courtesy. And how is your poor Ed? asked Liza's mother with sympathy. Oh, it's been aching cruel. I've hardly known what to do with myself. I'm sure he ought to be ashamed of himself for treating you like that. Oh, it wasn't his blows I minded so much, Mrs Kemp, replied Mrs Stanley. And don't you think it? It was what he said to me. I can stand a blow as well as any woman. I don't mind that, and when he don't take a mean advantage of me, I can stand up for myself and give as good as I take. And many's a time I gave my first husband a black eye. But the language he used and the things he called me, it made me blush to the roots of my hair. I'm not used to being spoken to like that. I was in good circumstances when my first husband was alive. He earned between two and three pound a week, he did. As I said to him, this morning, how a gentleman can use such language, I don't know. Husbands is cautions, however good they are, said Mrs. Kemp aphoristically. But I mustn't stay out in the night air. Has your rheumatism been troubling you lately? asked Mrs. Stanley. Oh, cruel. Liza rubs me with embrocation every night, but it torments me cruel. Mrs. Kemp then went into the house, and Liza remained to talk to Mrs. Stanley. She, too, had to go in, and Liza was left alone. Some while she spent thinking of nothing, staring vacantly in front of her, enjoying the cool and quiet of the evening. But Liza could not be left alone for long. Several boys came along with a bat and ball and fixed upon the road just in front of her for their pitch. Taking off their coats, they piled them at the two ends and were ready to begin. "'I say, old gal,' said one of them to Liza, "'come and have a game of cricket, will you?' "'Nah, Bob, I'm tired.' "'Come on.' "'Nah, I tell you I won't.' She was on the booze yesterday, and she ain't got over it, cried another boy. I'll swipe you over the snitch, replied Liza to him, and then, on being asked again, said, Leave me alone, won't you? Liza's got the needle tonight, that's flat, commented a third member of the team. I wouldn't drink if I was you, Liza, added another with mock gravity. It's a bad habit to get into, and he began rolling and swaying about like a drunken man. If Liza had been in form, she would have gone straight away and given the whole lot of them a sample of her strength. But she was only rather bored and vexed that they should disturb her quietness, so she let them talk. They saw she was not to be drawn, and leaving her, set to their game. She watched them for some time, but her thoughts gradually lost themselves, and insensibly her mind was filled with a burly form, and she was again thinking of Jim. He is a good sort to want to take me to the play, she said to herself. Tom never asked me. Jim had said he would come out in the evening. He ought to be here soon, she thought. Of course, she wasn't going to the theatre with him, but she didn't mind talking to him. She rather enjoyed being asked to do a thing and refusing, and she would have liked another opportunity of doing so. But he didn't come, and he had said he would. I say, Bill, she said at last to one of the boys, who was fielding close beside her. Out there, Blakeston. Do you know him? Yes, rather. Why, he works at the same place as me. What's he do with himself in the evening? I never see him about. I don't know. I see him this evening going to the Red Lion. I suppose he's there, but I don't know. Then he wasn't coming. Of course, she had told him she was going to stay indoors, but he might have come all the same, just to see. I know Tom would have come, she said to herself rather sulkily. Liza! Liza! She heard her mother's voice calling her. All right, I'm coming, said Liza. I've been waiting for you this last half hour to rub me. Why didn't you call? asked Liza. I did call. I've been calling this last I don't know how long. It gives me quite a sore throat. I never heard you. Nah, you didn't want to hear me, did you? You don't mind if I dies with rheumatics, do you? I know. Liza did not answer, but took the bottle and pouring some of the liniment on her hand, began to rub it into Mrs. Kemp's rheumatic joints, while the invalid kept complaining and grumbling at everything Liza did. Don't rub so hard, Liza. You'll rub all the skin off. Then, when Liza did it as gently as she could, she grumbled again. If you do it like that, it won't do no good at all. You want to save yourself trouble. I know you. 
When I was young, girls didn't mind a little bit of hard work. But, Lord bless you, you don't care about my rheumatics, do you? At last she finished, and Liza went to bed by her mother's side. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of Liza of Lambeth by W. Somerset Maugham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hatton Forty Three, Blog de la Quinzaine. WordPress. Com. Two days passed, and it was Friday morning. Liza had got up early and strolled off to her work in good time, but she did not meet her faithful Sally on the way, nor find her at the factory when she herself arrived. The bell rang and all the girls trooped in, but Sally still did not come. Liza could not make it out, and was thinking she would be shut out, when just as the man who gave out the tokens of the day's work was pulling down the shutter in front of his window, Sally arrived, breathless and perspiring. Oh, go lummy, I'm hot, she said, wiping her face with her apron. I thought you wasn't coming, said Liza. Well, I only just did. I overslept myself. I was out late last night. Were you? Me and Harry went to see the play. Oh, Liza, it's simply spiffin'. I've never seen such a good play in my life. Law, why, it makes your blood run cold. They hang a man on the stage. Oh, it made me creep all over. And then she began telling Liza all about it. The blood and thunder, the shooting, the railway train, the murder, the bomb, the hero, the funny man, jumbling everything up in her excitement, repeating little scraps of dialogue, all wrong, gesticulating, getting excited and red in the face at the recollection. Liza listened rather crossly, feeling bored at the detail into which Sally was going. The piece didn't really much interest her. One would think you'd never been to a theatre in your life before, she said. I've never seen anything so good, I can tell you. You take more tip and get Tom to take you. I don't want to go. And if I did, I'd pay for myself and go alone. Cheese it. That ain't half so good. Me and Harry, we set together. "'him with his arm round my waist and me old in his hand. "'It was jam, I can tell you. "'Well, I don't want anyone sprawling me about. "'That ain't my mark. "'But I do like Harry. "'You don't know the little ways he has. "'And we're going to be married in three weeks now. "'Harry said, well, he says, I'll get a licence. "'Nah,' says I, have the bands read out in church. "'It seems more regular like to have bands. "'So they're going to be read out next Sunday. "'You'll come with me and hear them, won't you, Liza?' Yes, I don't mind. On the way home, Sally insisted on stopping in front of the poster and explaining to Liza all about the scene represented. Oh, you give me the sick with your fight or card, you do. I'm going home. And she left Sally in the midst of her explanation. I don't know what's up with Liza, remarked Sally to a mutual friend. She's always got the needle somehow. Oh, she's balmy, answered the friend. Well, I do think she's a bit dotty sometimes. I do really, rejoined Sally. Liza walked homewards, thinking of the play. At length, she tossed her head impatiently. I don't want to see the blasted thing, and if I see that there, Jim, I'll tell him so. Swap me bob, I will. She did see him. He was leaning with his back against the wall of his house, smoking. Liza knew he had seen her, and as she walked by, pretended not to have noticed him. To her disgust, he let her pass and she was thinking he hadn't seen her, after all, when she heard him call her name. Liza! She turned round and started with surprise, very well imitated. I didn't see you was there, she said. Why did you pretend not to notice me as you went past, eh, Liza? Why, I didn't see you. Gone, but you ain't shirty with me. What have I got to be shirty about? He tried to take her hand, but she drew it away quickly. She was getting used to the movement. They went on talking but Jim did not mention the theatre. Liza was surprised, and wondered whether he had forgotten. Uh, Sally went to the play last night, she said at last. Oh, he said, and that was all. She got impatient. Well, I'm off, she said. Nah, don't go yet. I want to talk to you, he replied. What about? Anything in particular? She would drag it out of him if she possibly could. Not that I knows on, he said, smiling. Good night, she said abruptly turning away from him. Well, I'm damned if he ain't forgotten, she said to herself, sulkily, as she marched home. The following evening, about six o'clock, it suddenly struck her that it was the last night of the new and sensational drama. I do like that, Jim Blakeston, she said to herself. Fancy treating me like that. 
you wouldn't catch Tom doing such a thing. Blimey, if I speak to him again, the... Now I shan't see it at all. I've a good mind to go on my own hook. Fancy is forgetting all about it, like that. She was really quite indignant, though, as she had distinctly refused Jim's offer, it was rather hard to see why. He said he'd wait for me outside the doors. Wonder if he's there. I'll go and see if he is. See if I don't. And then, if he's there, I'll go in on my own hook just to spy him. She dressed herself in her best and, so that the neighbours shouldn't see her, went up a passage between some model lodging house buildings and in this roundabout way got into the Westminster Bridge Road and soon found herself in front of the theatre. I've been waiting for you this half hour. She turned round and saw Jim standing just behind her. Who are you talking to? I'm not going to the play with you. What'd you take me for, eh? Who are you going with, then? I'm going alone. Gone, don't be a blooming jackass. Liza was feeling very injured. That's how you treat me. I shall go home. Why didn't you come out the other night? You told me not to. She snorted at the ridiculous ineptitude of the reply. Why didn't you say nothing about it yesterday? Why? I thought you'd come if I didn't talk on it. Well, I think you're a... brute. She felt very much inclined to cry. Come on, Liza, don't take on. I didn't mean no offence. And he put his arm round her waist and led her to take their places at the gallery door. Two tears escaped from the corners of her eyes and ran down her nose, but she felt very relieved and happy and let him lead her where he would. There was a long string of people waiting at the door, and Liza was delighted to see a couple of niggers who were helping them to while away the time of waiting. They sang and danced and made faces while the people looked on with appreciative gravity, like royalty listening to Dereske, and they were very generous of applause and halfpence at the end of the performance. Then, when they moved to the pit doors, paper boys came along, offering tidbits and extra specials, after that, three little girls came round and sang sentimental songs and collected more halfpence. At last, a movement ran through the serpent-like string of people. Sounds were heard behind the door. Everyone closed up. The men told the woman to keep close and hold tight. There was a great unbarring and unbolting. The doors were thrown open, and like a bursting river, the people surged in. Half an hour more, and the curtain went up. The play was indeed thrilling. Liza quite forgot her companion was intent on the scene. She watched the incidents breathlessly, trembling with excitement, almost beside herself at the celebrated hanging incident. When the curtain fell on the first act, she sighed and mopped her face. See how hot I am, she said to Jim, giving him her hand. Yes, you are, he remarked, taking it. Leave go, she said, trying to withdraw it from him. Not much, he answered, quite boldly. Go on, leave go, but he didn't and she really did not struggle very violently. The second act came, and she shrieked over the comic man, and her laughter rang higher than anyone else's, so that people turned to look at her, and said, She is enjoying herself. Then, when the murder came, she bit her nails, and the sweat stood on her forehead in great drops. In her excitement, she even called out as loud as she could to the victim, Look out! It caused a laugh and slackened the tension, for the whole house was holding its breath, as it looked at the villains listening at the door, creeping silently forward, crawling like tigers to their prey. Liza, trembling all over and in terror, threw herself against Jim, who put both his arms round her, and said, Don't be afraid, Liza, it's all right. At last the men sprang, there was a scuffle, and the wretch was killed. Then came the scene depicted on the posters, the victim's son, knocking at the door, on the inside of which were the murderers and the murdered man. At last the curtain came down, and the house in relief burst forth into cheers and cheers. The handsome hero in his top hat was greeted thunderously. The murdered man, with his clothes still all disarranged, was hailed with sympathy. And the villains, the house yelled and hissed and booed, while the poor brutes bowed and tried to look as if they liked it. I am enjoying myself, said Liza, pressing herself quite close to Jim. You are a good sort to take me, Jim. He gave her a little hug, and it struck her that she was sitting just as Sally had done, and like Sally, she found it jam. The entracte was short, and the curtain was soon up, and the comic man raised customary laughter by undressing and exposing his nether garments to the public view. Then more tragedy, and the final act, with its darkened room, its casting lots, and its explosion. 
When it was all over and they had got outside, Jim smacked his lips and said, I could do with a gargle. Let's go into that pub there. I'm as dry as a bone, said Liza, and so they went. When they got in, they discovered they were hungry, and seeing some appetising sausage rolls, ate of them, and washed them down with a couple of pots of beer. Then Jim lit his pipe and they strolled off. They had got quite near the Westminster Bridge Road when Jim suggested they should go and have one more drink before closing time. I shall be tight, said Liza. That don't matter, answered Jim, laughing. You ain't got to go to work in the morning, and you can sleep at air. All right, I don't mind if I do, then. In for a penny, in for a pound. At the pub door, she drew back. I say, Governor, she said. There'll be some of the coves from down our street, and they'll see us. Nah, there won't be nobody there. Don't you have no fear? I don't like to go in for fear of it. Well, we ain't doing no harm if they don't see us, and we can go into the private bar, and you bet your boots there won't be no one there. She yielded, and they went in. Two pints of bitter, please, miss, ordered Jim. I say, old Ard, I can't drink more than half a pint, said Liza. Cheese it, answered Jim. You can do with all you can get, I know. At closing time, they left and walked down the broad road, which led homewards. Let's have a little sit down, said Jim, pointing to an empty bench between two trees. Nah, it's getting late. I want to be home. It's such a fine night. It's a pity to go in already, and he drew her unresisting towards the sea. He put his arm round her waist. Unhand me, villain, she said, in apt misquotation of the melodrama. But Jim only laughed, and she made no effort to disengage herself. They sat there for a long while in silence. The beer had got to Liza's head, and the warm night air filled her with a double intoxication. She felt the arm round her waist, and the big, heavy form, pressing against her side. She experienced again the most curious sensation, as if her heart were about to burst, and it choked her. A feeling so oppressive and painful almost made her feel sick. Her hands began to tremble, and her breath grew rapid, as though she was suffocating. Almost fainting, she swayed over towards the man, and a cold shiver ran through her from top to toe. Jim bent over, and taking her in both arms, he pressed his lips to hers in a long, passionate kiss. At last, panting for breath, she turned her head away and groaned. Then they sat for a long while in silence, Liza full of a strange happiness, feeling as if she could laugh aloud hysterically, but restrained by the calm and silence of the night. Close behind struck a church clock. One. Bless my soul, said Liza, starting. There's one o'clock. I must get home. It's so nice out here. Do stay, Liza. He pressed her closer to him. You know, Liza, I love you. Fit to kill. Now, nah, I can't stay. Come on. She got up from the seat and pulled him up too. Come on, she said. Without speaking, they went along, and there was no one to be seen, either in front or behind them. He had not got his arm round her now, and they were walking side by side, slightly separated. It was Liza who spoke first. You'd better go down the road and by the church and get into Veer Street the other end and I'll go through the passage so that no one should see us coming together. She spoke in almost a whisper. All right, Liza, he answered. I'll do just as you tell me. They came to the passage of which Liza spoke. It was a narrow way between blank walls, the backs of factories, and it led into the upper end of Veer Street. The entrance to it was guarded by two iron posts in the middle so that horses or barrows should not be taken through it. They had just got to it when a man came out into the open road, Liza quickly turned her head away. I wonder if he see us, she said when he passed out of earshot. He's looking back, she added. Why, who is it? asked Jim. It's a man out of our street, she answered. I don't know him, but I know where he lodges. Do you think he sees us? Nah, he wouldn't know who it was in the dark, but he looked round. All the street will know it if he see us. Well, we ain't doing no harm. She stretched out her hand to say goodbye to say good night. I'll come away with you along the passage, said Jim. Nah, you mustn't. You must go straight round. But it's so dark. Perhaps something will happen to you. Not it. You go on home and leave me, she replied, and entering the passage stood facing him with one of the iron pillars between them. Good night, old cock, she said, stretching out her hand. He took it and said, I wish you wasn't going to leave me, Liza. 
Gone, I must. She tried to get her hand away from his, but he held it firm, resting it on top of the pillar. Leave go my hand, she said. He made no movement, but he looked into her eyes steadily so that it made her uneasy. She repented having come out with him. Leave go my hand. And she beat down on his with her closed fist. Liza, he said at last. Well, what is it? she answered, still thumping down on his hand with her fist. Liza, he said a whisper. Will you? Will I what? she said, looking down. You know, Liza, say, will you? Nah, she said. He bent over her and repeated, will you? She did not speak but kept beaking down on his hand. Liza, he said again, his voice growing hoarse and thick. Liza, will you? She still kept silence, looking away and continually bringing down her fist. He looked at her for a moment, and she, ceasing to thump his hand, looked up at him with half-opened mouth. Suddenly, he shook himself, and closing his fist, gave her a violent swinging blow in the belly. Come on, he said and together they slid down into the darkness of the passage. End of chapter 7《Chapter 8 of Liza of Lambeth by W. Somerset Maugham • This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. • Recording by Hatton43, blogdelacanzen.wordpress.com • Mrs. Kemp was in the habit of slumbering somewhat heavily on Sunday mornings, or Liza would have not been allowed to go on sleeping as she did. When she woke, she rubbed her eyes to gather her senses together, and gradually she remembered having gone to the theatre on the previous evening. Then suddenly everything came back to her. She stretched out her legs and gave a long sigh of delight. Her heart was full. She thought of Jim, and the delicious sensation of love came over her. Closing her eyes, she imagined his warm kisses, and she lifted up her arms as if to put them round his neck and draw him down to her. She almost felt the rough beard on her face and the strong, heavy arms round her body. She smiled to herself and took a long, deep breath. Then, slipping back the sheets of her nightdress, she looked down at her own thin arms, just two pieces of bone with not a muscle on them, but very white and showing distinctly the interlacement of blue veins. She did not notice that her hands were rough, and red and dirty with the nails broken, and bitten to the quick. She got out of bed, and looked at herself in the glass over the mantelpiece. With one hand she brushed back her hair, and smiled at herself. Her face was very small and thin, but the complexion was nice, clear and white, with a delicate tint of red on the cheeks, and her eyes were big and dark like her hair. She felt very happy. She did not want to dress yet, but rather to sit down and think. So she twisted up her hair into a little knot, slipped a skirt over her nightdress, and sat on a chair near the window, and began looking round. The decorations of the room had been centred on the mantelpiece. The chief ornament consisted of a pear and an apple, a pineapple, a bunch of grapes, and several fat plums, all very beautifully done in wax, as was the fashion about the middle of this most glorious reign. They were appropriately coloured, the apple blushing red, the grapes an inky black, emerald green leaves were scattered here and there to lend finish, and the whole was mounted on an ebonised stand covered with black velvet, and protected from dust and dirt by a beautiful glass cover bordered with red plush. Liza's eyes rested on this with approbation, and the pineapple quite made her mouth water. At the end of the mantelpiece were pink jars, with blue flowers on the front. Round the top in gothic letters of gold was inscribed, a present from a friend. These were products of a latter, but not less artistic age. The intervening spaces were taken up with little jars and cups and saucers, gold inside, with a view of a town outside, and surrounding them, a present from Clacton-on-Sea, or, alliteratively, a memento of Margate. Of these, many were broken, but they had been mended with glue, and it is well known that pottery, in the eyes of the connoisseur, loses none of its value by a crack or two. Then, there were portraits innumerable, little yellow carte de visite in velvet frames, some of which were decorated with shells. They showed strange people with old-fashioned clothes, 
the woman with bedesis and sleeves fitting close to the figure, stern-featured females with hair carefully parted in the middle and plastered down on each side, firm chins and mouths, with small, pig-like eyes and wrinkled faces, and the men were uncomfortably clad in Sunday garments, very stiff and uneasy in their awkward postures, with large whiskers and shaved chins and upper lips, and a general air of horny-handed toil. Then there were one or two daguerreotypes, little, full-length figures framed in gold paper. There was one of Mrs. Kemp's father and one of her mother, and there were several photographs of betrothed or newly married couples, the lady sitting down, and the man standing behind her with his hand on the chair, or the man sitting, and the woman with her hand on his shoulder. But from all sides of the room, standing on the mantelpiece, hanging above it, on the wall and over the bed, they stared full face into the room, self-consciously fixed for ever in their stiff discomfort. The walls were covered with dingy, antiquated paper, and ornamented with coloured supplements from Christmas numbers. There was a very patriotic picture of a soldier shaking the hand of a fallen comrade, and waving his arm in defiance of a band of advancing Arabs. There was a cherry ripe, almost black, and with age and dirt. There were two almanacs, several years old, one with a coloured portrait of the Marquess of Lorn, very handsomely and elegantly dressed, the object of Mrs. Kemp's adoration since her husband's demise, the other a jubilee portrait of the Queen, somewhat losing in dignity, by a moustache which Liza, in an irreverent moment, had smeared on with charcoal. The furniture consisted of a washstand and a little deal chest of drawers, which acted as sideboard to such pots and pans and crockery as could not find room in the grate, and besides the bed there was nothing but two kitchen chairs and a lamp. Liza looked at it all and felt perfectly satisfied. She put a pin into one corner of the noble Marquess to prevent him from falling, fiddled about with the ornaments a little, and then started washing herself. After putting on her clothes, she ate some bread and butter, swallowed a dishful of cold tea, and went out into the street. She saw some boys playing cricket and went up to them. Let me play, she said. All right, Liza, cried half a dozen of them in delight, and the captain added, You go and scout over by the lamppost. Go and scout my eye, said Liza indignantly. When I play cricket, I does the batting. Now, you're not going to bat all the time. Who are you getting at? replied the captain, who had taken advantage of his position to put himself in first, and was still at the wicket. Well then, I shan't play, answered Liza. Garn, Ernie, let her go in, shouted two or three members of the team. Well, I'm busted, remarked the captain, as she took his bat. You won't stay in long, I lay, he said, as he sent the old bowl of fielding and took the ball himself. He was a young gentleman who did not suffer from excessive backwardness. Add, shouted a dozen voices as the ball went past Liza's bat and landed in the pile of coats which formed the wicket. The captain came forward to resume his innings, but Liza held the bat away from him. Gone, she said. That was only a trial. You never said trial, answered the captain indignantly. Yes, I did, said Liza. I said it was just as the ball was coming, under my breath. Well, I am busted, repeated the captain. Just then, Liza saw Tom among the lookers-on, and as she felt very kindly disposed to the world in general that morning, she called out to him. Hello, Tom, she said. Come and give us a ball. This chap can't bowl. Well, I got you out, anyhow, said that person, and he wouldn't have got me out playing square. But a trial ball, well, one don't ever know what a trial ball's going to do. Tom began bowling very slowly and easily, so that Liza could swing her bat round and hit mightily. She ran well, too and pantingly brought up her score to twenty. Then the fielders interposed. I say, look here, he's only given her lobs. He's not trying to get her out. You're spoiling our game. I don't care. I've got twenty runs. That's more than you could do. I'll go out now of my own accord, so there. Come on, Tom. Tom joined her. As the captain at last resumed his bat and the game went on, they commenced talking. Liza, leaning against the wall of a house, while Tom stood in front of her, smiling with pleasure. Where have you been hiding yourself, Tom? I ain't seen you for I don't know how long. I've been about as usual, and I've seen you when you didn't see me. Well, you might have come up and said good morning when you did see me. I didn't want to force myself on you, Eliza. Go on, you're a bloomin' cuckoo. I'm blowed. I thought you didn't like me hanging round you, so I kept my way. 
Why, you talks as if I didn't like you. You don't think I'd have come out being fastened with you if I hadn't liked you. Liza was really very dishonest, but she felt so happy this morning that she loved the whole world, and of course Tom came in with the others. She looked very kindly at him, and he was so affected that a great lump came in his throat, and he could not speak. Liza's eyes turned to Jim's house, and she saw coming out of the door a girl of about her own age. She fancied she saw in her some likeness to Jim. Say, Tom, she asked, that ain't Blakeston's daughter, is it? Yes, that's it. I'll go and speak to her, said Liza, leaving Tom and going over the road. You're Polly Blakeston, ain't you? she said. That's me, said the girl. I thought you was. Your dad, he says to me, you don't know my daughter Polly, do you? says he. No, nah, says I, I don't. Well, says he, you can't miss her when you see her, and right enough I didn't. Mother says I'm all father, and there ain't nothing of her in me. Dad says it's lucky it ain't the other way about, or he'd have got a divorce. They both laughed. "'Where are you going now?' asked Liza, looking at the slop basin she was carrying. "'I was just going down into the road to get some ice cream for dinner. "'Father had a bit of luck last night,' he says, "'and he'd stand a lot of us ice cream for dinner today. "'I'll come with you if you like. "'Come on.' "'And already friends, they walked arm in arm to the Westminster Bridge Road. "'Then they went along till they came to a store "'where an Italian was selling the required commodity, "'having had a taste apiece to see if they liked it. Polly planked down sixpence and had her basin filled with a poisonous-looking mixture of red and white ice cream. On the way back, looking up the street, Polly cried, There's father! Liza's heart beat rapidly and she turned red, but suddenly a sense of shame came over her. Casting down her head so that she might not see him, she said, I think I'll be off home and see how mother's getting on. And before Polly could say anything, she had slipped away and entered her own house. Mother was not getting on at all well. You've come in at last, you... You... snarled Mrs. Kemp as Liza entered the room. What's the matter, Mother? Matter? I like that. Matter indeed. Go and matter yourself and be mattered. Nice way to treat an old woman like me, and your own mother too. What's up now? Don't talk to me. I don't want to listen to you. Leaving me all alone, me with my rheumatics, and the neurology. I've had the neurology all morning, and my head's been simply splitting so that I thought the bones had come apart and all my brains go streaming on the floor. And when I wake up, there's no one to get my tea for me, and I lay there waiting and waiting, and at last I had to get up and make it myself, and my head's simply cruel. Why, I might have been burnt to death with the fire alight and me asleep. Well, I am sorry, Mother, but I went out just for a bit, and didn't think you'd wake. And besides, the fire wasn't alight. Gone with you. I didn't treat my mother like that. Oh, you've been a bad daughter to me, and I had more illness carrying you than with all the other children put together. You was a cross at your birth, and you've been a cross ever since. And now in my old age, when I've worked myself to the bone, it leaves me to starve and burn to death. Here she began to cry, and the rest of her utterances was lost in sobs. The dusk had darkened into night, and Mrs. Kemp had retired to rest with the dicky birds. Liza was thinking of many things. She wondered why she had been unwilling to meet Jim in the morning. I was a bally fool, she said to herself. It really seemed an age since the previous night, and all that had happened seemed very long ago. She had not spoken to Jim all day, and she had so much to say to him. Then, wondering whether he was about, she went to the window and looked out. But there was nobody there. She closed the window again and sat just beside it. The time went on. She wondered whether he would come asking herself whether he had been thinking of her as she of him. Gradually her thoughts grew vague, and a kind of mist came over them. She nodded. Suddenly she roused herself with a start, fancying she had heard something. She listened again, and in a moment the sound was repeated. Three or four gentle taps on the window. She opened it quickly and whispered, Jim! That's me, he answered. Come out. Closing the window, she went into the passage and opened the street door was hardly unlocked before Jim had pushed his way in, partly shutting it behind her. He took her in his arms and hugged her to his breast. She kissed him passionately. I thought you'd come tonight, Jim. Some in my aunt told me so, but you have been long. I wouldn't come before, because I thought there'd be people about. Kiss us. And again he pressed his lips to hers, and Liza nearly fainted with the delight of it. 
Let's go for a walk, shall we? He said. All right. They were speaking in whispers. You go into the road through the passage, and I'll go by the street. Yes, that's right. And kissing her once more, he slid out. She closed the door behind him. Then, going back to get her hat, she came again to the passage, waiting behind the door till it might be safe for her to venture. She had not made up her mind to risk it when she heard a key in the lock, and she hardly had time to spring back to prevent herself from being hit by the opening door. It was a man, one of the upstairs lodgers. Halloa, he said. Who's there? Mr. Rogers. Strikes me. You did give me a turn. I was just going out. She blushed to her hair, but in the darkness he could see nothing. Good night, she said, and went out. She walked closely along the sides of the houses like a thief, and the policeman, as she passed him, turned round and looked at her, wondering whether she was meditating some illegal deed. She breathed freely on coming into the open road, and seeing Jim skulking behind a tree, ran up to him, and in the shadows they kissed again. End of chapter 8《where the Westminster Bridge Road bends down to get to the river, and they would go off, arm in arm, till they came to some place where they could sit down and rest. Sometimes they would walk along the Albert Embankment to Battersea Park, and here sit on the benches, watching the children play. The female cyclist had almost abandoned Battersea for the parks on the other side of the river, but often enough one went by, and Liza, with the old-fashioned prejudice of her class, would look after the rider, and make some remark about her, not seldom more forcible than ladylike. Both Jim and she liked children, and tiny, ragged urchins would gather round to have rides on the man's knees, or mock fights with Liza. They thought themselves far away from anyone in Veer Street, but twice, as they were walking along, they were met by people they knew. Once it was two workmen coming home from a job at Vauxhall. Liza did not see them till they were quite near. She immediately dropped Jim's arms, and they both cast their eyes to the ground as the men passed, like ostriches, expecting that if they did not look up, they would not be seen. "'Did you see him, Jim?' asked Liza in a whisper when they had gone by. "'I wonder if they see us.' Almost instinctively she turned round, and at the same moment one of the men turned too. Then there was no doubt about it. "'That did give me a turn,' she said. "'So it did me,' answered Jim. "'I simply went all over.' We was bally fools, said Liza. We ought to have spoken to him. Do you think they'll let out? They heard nothing of it. When Jim afterwards met one of them in a public house, he did not mention a meeting, and they thought that perhaps they had not been recognised. But the second time was worse. It was on the Albert Embankment again. They were met by a party of four, all of whom lived in the street. Liza's heart sank within her, for there was no chance of escape. She thought of turning quickly and walking in the opposite direction, but there was not time, for the men had already seen them. She whispered to Jim, Back us up. And as they met, she said to one of the men, Hello, are there? Where are you off to? The men stopped, and one of them asked the question back, Where are you off to? Me? Oh, I've just been to the hospital. One of the gals at our place is queer, and so I says to myself, I'll go and see her. She faltered a little as she began, but quickly gathered herself together lying fluently and without hesitation. And when I come out, she went on, who should I see just passing the hospital but this here cove? And he says to me, what cheer, says he, I'm going to Vauxhall. Come and walk a bit of the way with us. All right, says I, I don't mind if I do. One man winked and another said, go it, Liza. She fired up with the dignity of outraged innocence. What do you mean by that, she said. Do you think I'm kidding? Kidding? No. You've only just come up from the country, ain't you? Think I'm kidding? What do you think I want to kid for? Liars never believe anyone, that's fact. Now then, Liza, don't be saucy. Saucy, I'll smack you in the eye if you say much to me. Come on, 
she said to Jim, who had been standing sheepishly by, and they walked away. The men shouted, Now we shan't be long, and went off laughing. After that, they decided to go where there was no chance at all of being seen. They did not meet till they got over Westminster Bridge, and thence they made their way into the park. They would lie down on the grass in one another's arms, and thus spend the long summer evenings. After the heat of the day, there would be a gentle breeze in the park, and they would take in long breaths of the air. It seemed far away from London. It was so quiet and cool, and Liza, as she lay by Jim's side, felt her love for him overflowing to the rest of the world, and enveloping mankind itself in a kind of grateful happiness. If it could only have lasted, they would stay and see the stars shine out dimly, one by one, from the blue sky, till it grew late, and the blue darkened into black, and the stars glittered in thousands all above them. But as the nights grew cooler, they found it cold on the grass, and the time they had there seemed too short for the long journey they had to make. So crossing the bridges before, they strolled along the embankment till they came to a vacant bench, and there they would sit, with Liza nestling close up to her lover, and his great arms around her. The rain of September made no difference to them. They went on as usual to their seat beneath the trees, and Jim would take Liza on his knee, and opening his coat, shelter her with it, while she, with her arms round his neck, pressed very close to him, and occasionally gave a little laugh of pleasure and delight. They hardly spoke at all through these evenings, for what had they to say to one another? Often, without exchanging a word, they would sit for an hour, with their faces touching, the one feeling on his cheek the hot breath from the other's mouth, while at the end of the time, the only motion was an upraising of Liza's lips, a bending down of Jim's, so that they might meet and kiss. Sometimes Liza fell into a light doze, and Jim would sit very still for fear of waking her and when she roused herself, she would smile while he bent down again and kissed her. They were very happy. But the hours passed by so quickly that Big Ben striking twelve came upon them as a surprise, and unwillingly they got up and made their way homewards. Their partings were never-ending. Each evening, Jim refused to let her go from his arms, and tears stood in his eyes at the thought of the separation. I'd give something, he would say, if we could be together always. Never mind, old chap, Liza would answer, herself half crying. It can't be helped, so we must jolly well lump it. But notwithstanding all their precautions, people in Veer Street appeared to know. First of all, Liza noticed that the woman did not seem quite so cordial as before, and she often fancied they were talking of her. When she passed by, they appeared to look at her, then say something or other, and perhaps burst out laughing. But when she approached, they would immediately stop speaking, keep silence in a rather awkward, constrained manner. For a long time she was unwilling to believe that there was any change in them, and Jim, who had observed nothing, persuaded her that it was all fancy. But gradually it became clearer, and Jim had to agree with her that somehow or other people had found out. Once, when Liza had been talking to Polly, Jim's daughter, Mrs. Blakeston had called her. When the girl had come to her mother, Liza saw that she spoke angrily, and they both looked across at her. When Liza caught Mrs. Blakeston's eye, she saw in her face a surly scowl, which almost frightened her. She wanted to brave it out, and stepped forward a little, to go and speak with the woman. But Mrs. Blakeston, standing still, looked so angrily at her, that she was afraid to. When she told Jim, his face grew dark, and he said, Blast the woman, I'll give her what for if she says anything to you. Don't strike her, whatever happens, will you, Jim? said Liza. She'd better take care, then he answered, and he told her that lately his wife had been sulking and not speaking to him. The previous night, on coming home after the day's work and bidding her good evening, she had turned her back on him without answering. Can't you answer when you spoke to, he had said. Good evening, she had replied sulkily, with her back still turned. After that, Liza noticed that Polly avoided her. What's up, Polly? she said to her one day. You never speaks now. Have you had your tongue cut out? Me? I ain't get nothing to speak about that I knows of, answered Polly, abruptly walking off. Liza grew very red, and quickly looked to see if anyone had noticed the incident. A couple of youths sitting on the pavement had seen it, and she saw them nudge one another and wink. Then the fellows about the street began to chaff her. You look pale, said one of a group to her one day. 
You're overworking yourself, you are, said another. Married life don't agree with Liza, that's what it is, added a third. Who do you think you're getting at? I am married and never like to be, she answered. Liza has all the pleasures of a husband and none of the trouble. Blimey if I know what you mean, said Liza. No, of course not. You don't know nothing, do you? Innocent as a babe. Our father would chart in heaven. Haven't been in London long, have you? They spoke in chorus, and Liza stood in front of them, bewildered, not knowing what to answer. Don't you make no mistake about it, Liza knows a thing or two. Oh, me darling, I love you fit to kill, but take care your missus ain't round the corner. This was particularly bold, and they all laughed. Liza felt very uncomfortable, and fiddled about with her apron, wondering how she could get away. Take care you don't get into trouble, that's all, said one of the men, with burlesque gravity. You might give us a chance, Liza. You come out with me one evening. You ought to give us all a turn, just to show there's no ill feeling. Blimey if I know what you're talking about. You're all balmy on the crumpet, said Liza indignantly, and turning her back on them, made for home. Among other things that had happened was Sally's marriage. One Saturday, a little procession had started from Veer Street, consisting of Sally, in a state of giggling excitement, her fringe magnificent after a whole week of curling papers, clad in a perfectly new velveteen dress, the colour known as electric blue, and Harry, rather nervous and ill at ease, in the unaccustomed restraint of a collar. These two walked arm in arm, and were followed by Sally's mother and uncle, also arm in arm, and the procession was brought up by Harry's brother and a friend. They started with a flourish of trumpets and an old boot, and walked down the middle of Veer Street, accompanied by the neighbours' good wishes, but as they got into the Westminster Bridge Road and nearer to the church, the happy couple grew silent, and Harry began to perspire freely, so that his collar gave him perfect torture. There was a public house just opposite the church, and it was suggested that they should have a drink before going in. As it was a solemn occasion, they went into the private bar, and there Sally's uncle, who was a man of means, ordered six pots of beer. "'Feeling a bit nervous, Harry?' asked his friend. "'Nah,' said Harry, as if he had been used to getting married every day of his life. Bit warm, that's all. You're very good health, Sally, said her mother, lifting her mug. This is the last time I shall ever address you as miss. And may she be as good a wife as you was, added Sally's uncle. Well, I don't think my old man ever had no complaint to make about me. I did my duty by him, although it's me as says it, answered the good lady. Well, mates, said Harry's brother, I reckon it's about time to go in. So here's to the health of Mr. Henry Atkins and his future missus. And God bless them, said Sally's mother. Then they went into the church, and as they solemnly walked up the aisle, a pale-faced young curate came out of the vestry and down to the bottom of the chancel. The beer had had a calming effect on their troubled minds, and both Harry and Sally began to think it a rather good joke. They smiled on each other, and at those parts of the service which they thought suggested, violently nudged one another in the ribs. When the ring had to be produced, Harry fumbled about in different pockets, and his brother whispered, Swap me Bob, he's gone and lost it. However, all went all right, and Sally, having carefully pocketed the certificate, they went out and had another drink to celebrate the happy event. In the evening, Liza and several friends came into the couple's room, which they had taken in the same house as Sally had lived in before, and drank the health of the bride and bridegroom, till they thought fit to retire. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of Liza of Lambeth by W. Somerset Maugham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hatton43, blogdelacanzen.wordpress.com. It was November. The fine weather had quite gone now, and with it much of the sweet pleasure of Jim and Liza's love. When they came out at night on the embankment, they found it cold and dreary. Sometimes a light fog covered the river banks and made the lamps glow out dim and large. A light rain would be falling, which sent a chill into their very souls. Foot passengers came along at rare intervals, holding up umbrellas and staring straight in front of them as they hurried along in the damp and cold. A cab would pass rapidly by, splashing up the mud on each side. The benches were deserted, except perhaps for some poor homeless wretch who could afford no shelter, and huddled up in a corner, with his head buried in his breast, was sleeping heavily like a dead man. 
The wet mud made Liza's skirts cling about her feet, and the damp would come in and chill her legs and creep up her body till she shivered and for warmth pressed herself close against Jim. Sometimes they would go into the third-class waiting rooms at Waterloo or Charing Cross and sit there, but it was not like the park or the embankment on summer nights. They had warmth, but the heat made their wet clothes steam and smell, and the gas flared in their eyes, and they hated the people perpetually coming in and out, opening the doors and letting in a blast of cold air. They hated the noise of the guards and porters shouting out the departure of the trains, the shrill whistling of the steam engine, the hurry and bustle and confusion. About eleven o'clock, when the trains grew less frequent, they got some quietness. Then their minds were troubled, and they felt heavy, sad, and miserable. One evening they had been sitting at Waterloo Station. It was foggy outside, a thick, yellow, November fog, entering the lungs and making the mouth taste nasty and the eyes smart. It was about half-past eleven, and the station was unusually quiet. A few passengers, in wraps and overcoats, were walking to and fro, waiting for the last train, but one or two porters were standing about yawning. Liza and Jim had remained for an hour in perfect silence, filled with a gloomy unhappiness, as of a great weight on their brain. Liza was sitting forward, with her elbows on her knees, resting her face on her hands. I wish I was straight, she said at last, not looking up. Well, why won't you come along with me altogether? And you'll be all right then, he answered. Nah, that's no go. I can't do that. He had often asked her to live with him entirely, but she had always refused. You can come along with me, and I'll take a room in a lodging house in Holloway, and we can live there as if we was married. What about your work? I can get work over the other side as well as I can here. I'm about sick of the way things is going on. So am I, but I can't leave mother. She can come too. Not when I'm not married. I shouldn't like her to know as I'd as I'd done wrong. Well, I'll marry her. Swap me, Bob. I wants her badly enough. You can't. You're married already. That don't matter. If I'll give the missus so much a week out of my screw, she'll sign a paper to give up all claim to me, and then we can get spliced. One of the men as I works with done that, and it was all right. Liza shook her head. Nah, you can't do that now. It's bigger me, and the cops takes you, and he gets twelve months hard for it. But swap me, Bob, Liza. I can't go on like this. You knows the missus. Well, there ain't no bloomin' doubt about it. She knows as you and me are carrying on, and she makes no bones about letting me see it. She don't do that. Well, she don't exactly say it, but she sulks and won't speak, and then when I says anything, she rounds on me and calls me all the names she can think of. I'd give her a good hiding, but somehow I don't like her. She makes the place a hell to me, and I'm not going to stand it no longer. You'll have to sit it then. You can't chuck it. Yes, I can, and I would if you'd come along with me. I don't believe you like me at all, Liza, or you'd come. She turned towards him and put her arms round his neck. You know I do, old cock, she said. I like you better than anyone else in the world, but I can't go away and leave mother. Belie me if I see why. She's never been much to you. She makes you slave away to pay the rent, and all the money she earns she boozes. That's true. She ain't been what you might call a good mother to me, but somehow she's my mother, and I don't like to leave her on her own. Now she's so old, and she can't do much with the rheumatics. And besides, Jim, dear, it ain't only mother, but there's your own kids. You can't leave them. He thought for a while, and then said, You're about right there, Liza. I don't know if I could get on without the kids. If I could only take them and you too, swap me, Bob, I should be happy. Liza smiled sadly. So you see, Jim, we're in a bloomin' hole, and there ain't no way out of it that I can see. He took her on his knees, and pressing her to him, kissed her very long and very lovingly. Well, we must trust to luck, she said again. Perhaps something'll happen soon, and everything'll come right in the end, when we gets four balls of worsted for a penny. It was past twelve, and separating, they went by different ways, along the dreary, wet, deserted roads, till they came to Veer Street. The street seemed quite different to Liza from what it had been three months before. Tom, the humble adorer, had quite disappeared from her life. One day, three or four weeks after the August bank holiday, she saw him dawdling along the pavement, and it suddenly struck her that she had not seen him for a long time. But she had been so full of her happiness 
that she had been unable to think of anyone but Jim. She wondered at his absence, since before wherever she had been, there was he certain to be also. She passed him, but to her astonishment he did not speak to her. She thought by some wonder he had not seen her, but she felt his gaze resting upon her. She turned back, and suddenly he dropped his eyes and looked down, walking on as if he had not seen her, but blushing furiously. Tom, she said, why don't you speak to me? He started and blushed more than ever. I didn't know you was there, he stuttered. Don't tell me, she said. What's up? Nothing as I knows of, he answered uneasily. I ain't offended yet, have I, Tom? Nah, not as I knows of, he replied, looking very unhappy. You don't ever come my way now, she said. I didn't know as you wanted to see me. Go on, you knows I likes you as well as anybody. You like so many people, Liza, he said, flushing. What do you mean? said Liza indignantly, but very red. She was afraid he knew now, and it was from him especially she would have been so glad to hide it. Nothing, he answered. One doesn't say things like that without any meaning, unless one's a blonde fool. You're right there, Liza, he answered. I am a blind fool. He looked at her a little reproachfully, she thought, and then he said goodbye and turned away. At first she was horrified that he should know of her love for Jim, but then she did not care. After all, it was nobody's business, and what did anything matter as long as she loved Jim and Jim loved her? Then she grew angry that Tom should suspect her. He could know nothing but that some of the men had seen her with Jim near Vauxhall, and it seemed mean that he should condemn her for that. Thenceforward, when she ran against Tom, she cut him. He never tried to speak to her, but as she passed him, pretending to look out in front of her, she could see that he always blushed, and she fancied his eyes were very sorrowful. Then several weeks went by, and as she began to feel more and more lonely in the street, she regretted the quarrel. She cried a little as she thought that she had lost his faithful, gentle love, and she would have much liked to be friends with him again. If he had only made some advance, she would have welcomed him so cordially. But she was too proud to go to him herself and beg him to forgive her. And then, how could he forgive her? She had lost Sally too, for on her marriage, Harry had made her give up the factory. He was a young man with principles worthy of a member of Parliament, and he had said, A woman's place is her own, and if her old man can't afford to keep her without her working in a factory, well, all I can say is that he'd better go and get single. Quite right too, agreed his mother-in-law, and what's more, she'll have a baby to look after soon, and that'll take her all her time, and there's no one as knows that better than me, for I've had twelve, to say nothing of two stills and one miss. Liza quite envied Sally her happiness, for the bride was brimming over with song and laughter. Her happiness overwhelmed her. I am happy, she said to Liza one day a few weeks after her marriage. You don't know what a good sort Harry is. He's just a darling and there's no mistake in it. I don't care what other people say, but what I says is there's nothing like marriage. Never a cross word passes his lips. And mother has all her meals with us, and he says all the better. Well, I'm that happy I simply don't know if I'm standing on my head or on my heels. But alas, it did not last too long. Sally was not so full of joy when next Liza met her, and one day her eyes looked very much as if she had been crying. What's the matter? asked Liza, looking at her. What have you been blubbering about? Me, said Sally, getting very red. Oh, I've got a bit of a toothache, and, well, I'm rather a fool-like, and it hurt so much that I couldn't help crying. Liza was not satisfied, but could get nothing further out of her. Then one day it came out. It was a Saturday night, the time when women in Veer Street weep. Liza went up into Sally's room for a few minutes, on her way to the Westminster Bridge Road, where she was to meet Jim. Harry had taken the top back room, and Liza, climbing up the second flight of stairs, called out as usual. What ho, Sally? The door remained shut, although Liza could see that there was a light in the room. But on getting to the door she stood still, for she heard the sound of sobbing. She listened for a minute, and then knocked. There was a little flurry inside, and someone called out, Who's there? Only me, said Liza, opening the door. As she did so, she saw Sally rapidly wipe her eyes and put her handkerchief away. Her mother was sitting by her side, evidently comforting her. 
"'What's up, Sal?' asked Liza. "'Nothing,' answered Sally, with a brave little gasp to stop the crying, turning her face downward so that Liza should not see the tears in her eyes. But they were too strong for her, and quickly taking out her handkerchief, she hid her face in it, and began to sob broken-heartedly. Liza looked at the mother in interrogation. "'Oh, it's that man again,' said the lady, snorting and tossing her head. "'Not Harry?' asked Liza in surprise. "'Not Harry? Who is it if it ain't Harry, the villain?' "'What's he been doing, then?' asked Liza again. "'Been there. That's what he's been doing. "'Oh, the villain. He ought to be ashamed of himself, he ought.' "'I didn't know he was like that,' said Liza. "'Didn't you? I thought the old street knew it by now,' said Mrs. Cooper indignantly. "'Oh, he's a wrong and he is.' "'It wasn't his fault,' put in Sally, amidst her sobs. "'It's only because he's had a little drop too much. "'He's all right when he's sober. "'A little drop too much? I should just think he had the beast.' I'd give it him if I was a man. They're all like that. Husbands is all alike. They're all right when they're sober, sometimes. But when they've got liquor in them, they're beasts and no mistake. I had a husband myself for five and twenty years and I know him. Well, mother, sobbed Sally. It was all my fault. I should have come home earlier. Now, it wasn't your fault at all. Just look here, Liza. This is what he'd done and call himself a man. Just because Sally'd gone out to have a chat with Mrs. MacLeod next door. When she come in, he start banging her about. And me too. What do you think of that? Mrs. Cooper was quite purple with indignation. Yes, she went on. That's a man for you. Of course, I wasn't going to stand and see my daughter being knocked about. It wasn't likely, was it? And he rounds on me. He hits me with his fist. Look here. She pulled up her sleeves and showed two red and brawny arms. He's bruised my arms. I thought he'd broken it at first. If I hadn't put my arm up, he'd have got me on the head and he might have killed me. And I says to him, if you touch me again, I'll go to the police station, that I will. Well, that frightened him a bit, and then didn't I let him have it? You call yourself a man, says I. You ain't fit to clean the drains out. You should have heard the language he used. You dirty old woman, says he. You would go away. You're always interfering with me. Well, I don't like to repeat what he said, and that's the truth. And I says to him, I wish you'd never married my daughter, and if I'd known you was like this, I'd have died sooner than later. Well, I didn't know he was like that, said Liza. He was all right at first, said Sally. Yes, they're always all right at first. But to think it should have come to this now, when they ain't been married three months, and the first child not born yet, well, I think it's disgraceful. Liza stayed a little while longer, helping to comfort Sally, who kept pathetically taking to herself all the blame of the dispute, and then, bidding her good night and better luck, she slid off to meet Jim. When she reached the appointed spot, he was not to be found. She waited for some time, and at last saw him come out of the neighbouring pub. Good night, Jim, she said as she came up to him. So you've turned up, have you? He answered roughly, turning round. What's the matter, Jim? She asked in a frightened way, for he had never spoken to her in that manner. Nice thing to keep me waiting all night for you to come out. She saw that he had been drinking, and answered humbly, I'm very sorry, Jim, but I went in to see Sally, and a bloke had been knocking her about, and so I sat with her a bit. Knocking her about, Addy? And serve her damn well right too, and there's many more as could do with a good hiding. Liza did not answer. He looked at her, and then suddenly said, Come in and have a drink. Now nah, I'm not thirsty, I don't want a drink, she answered. Come on, he said angrily. Now, nah, Jim, you've had quite enough already. Who are you talking to, he said. Don't come if you don't want to. I'll go and have one by myself. Nah, Jim, don't, she caught hold of his arm. Yes, I shall, he said, going towards the pub, while she held him back. Let me go, can't you? Let me go. He roughly pulled his arm away from her. As she tried to catch hold of it again, he pushed her back, and in the little scuffle, caught her a blow over the face. Ow, she cried. You did hurt. He was sobered at once. Liza, he said, I ain't hurt you. She didn't answer, and he took her in his arms. Liza, I ain't hurt you, have I? Say I ain't hurt you. I'm so sorry. I beg your pardon, Liza. All right, old chap, she said, smiling charmingly on him. It wasn't the blow that hurt me so much. It was the way you was talking. I didn't mean it, Liza. He was so contrite. He could not humble himself enough. I had another blooming row with the missus tonight. Then, when I didn't find you here... And I kept waiting and waiting. Well, I fared downright lost my hair. 
two or three pints of four half and, well, I don't know. Never mind, old cock. I can stand more than that as long as you loves me. He kissed her, and they were quite friends again. But the little quarrel had another effect, which was worse for Liza. When she woke up the next morning, she noticed a slight soreness over the ridge of the bone under the left eye, and on looking in the glass saw that it was black and blue and green. She bathed it, but it remained, and seemed to get more marked. She was terrified lest people should see it, and kept indoors all day, but next morning it was blacker than ever. She went to the factory with a hat over her eyes and her head bent down. She escaped observation, but on the way home she was not so lucky. The sharp eyes of some of the girls noticed it first. "'What's the matter with your eye?' asked one of them. "'Me?' answered Liza, putting her hand up as if in ignorance. "'Nothing that I knows of.' Two or three young men were standing by, and hearing the girl looked up. "'Why, you've got a black eye, Liza. "'Me? I ain't got no black eye. "'Yes, you have. How'd you get it?' "'I don't know,' said Liza. "'I didn't know I had one.' "'Go on, tell us another,' was the answer. "'One doesn't get a black eye without knowing how they got it.' Well, I did fall against the chest of drawers yesterday. I suppose I must have got it then. Oh, yes. We believe that, don't we? I didn't know he was so handy with his dukes. Did you, Ted? Asked one man of another. Liza felt herself grow red to the tips of her toes. Who? she asked. Never you mind. Nobody you know. At that moment, Jim's wife passed and looked at her with a scowl. Liza wished herself a hundred miles away and blushed more violently than ever. What are you blushing about? ingenuously asked one of the girls, and they all looked from her to Mrs. Blakeston and back again. Someone said, How about our Sunday boots on now? And a titter went through them. Liza's nerve deserted her. She could think of nothing to say, and a sob burst from her. To hide the tears which were coming from her eyes, she turned away and walked homewards. Immediately, a great shout of laughter broke from the group, and she heard them positively screaming till she got into her own house. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Liza of Lambeth by W. Somerset Maugham This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hatton43, blog de la quinzaine.wordpress.com A few days afterwards, Liza was talking with Sally, who did not seem very much happier than when Liza had last seen her. He ain't what I thought he was, she said. I don't mind saying that but he has a lot to put up with. I expect I'm rather trying sometimes, and he means well. Perhaps he'll be kinder like when the baby's born. Cheer up, old gal, answered Liza, who had seen something of the lives of many married couples. It won't seem so bad after you gets used to it. It's a bit disappointing at first, but he gets not to mind it. After a little, Sally said she must go and see about her husband's tea. She said goodbye, and then rather awkwardly, Say, Liza, Take care of yourself. Take care of myself. Why? asked Liza in surprise. You know what I mean. Nah, darned if I do. That there Mrs. Blakeston, she's looking out for you. Mrs. Blakeston? Liza was startled. Yes, she says she's going to give you something if she can get hold on you. I should advise you take care. Me? said Liza. Sally looked away so as not to see the other's face. She says as how you've been messing about with her old man. Liza didn't say anything, and Sally, repeating her goodbye, slid off. Liza felt a chill run through her. She had several times noticed a scowl and a look of anger on Mrs. Blakeston's face, and she had avoided her as much as possible. But she had no idea that the woman meant to do anything to her. She was very frightened. A cold sweat broke out over her face. If Mrs. Blakeston got hold of her, she would be helpless. She was so small and weak while the other was strong and muscular. Liza wondered what she would do if she did catch her. That night she told Jim, and tried to make a joke of it. I say, Jim, your missus. She says she's going to give me socks if she catches me. My missus? How'd you know? She's been telling people in the street. God lummy, said Jim, furious. If she dares to touch her air of your head, swap me dicky, I'll give her such a hiding as she's never had before. By God, give me the chance, and I would let her have it. I'm blooming well sick of her sulks. He clenched his fists as he spoke. Liza was a coward. She could not help thinking of her enemy's threat. It got on her nerves, and she hardly dared go out for fear of meeting her. She would look nervously in front of her, 
quickly turning round if she saw in the distance anyone resembling Mrs. Blakeston. She dreamed of her at night. She saw the big, powerful form, the heavy, frowning face, and the curiously braided brown hair. And she would wake up with a cry and find herself bathed in sweat. It was the Saturday afternoon following this, a chilly November day, with the road sloshy, and a grey, comfortless sky that made one's spirit sink. It was about three o'clock, and Liza was coming home from work. She got into Veer Street, and was walking quickly towards her house when she saw Mrs. Blakeston coming towards her. Her heart gave a great jump. Turning, she walked rapidly in the direction she had come. With a screw round of her eyes, she saw that she was being followed, and therefore went straight out of Veer Street. She went right round, meaning to get into the street from the other end, and, unobserved, slip into her house, which was then quite close. But she dared not risk it immediately, for fear Mrs. Blakeston should still be there, so she waited about for half an hour. It seemed an age. Finally, taking her courage in both hands, she turned the corner and entered Veer Street. She nearly ran into the arms of Mrs. Blakeston, who was standing close to the public house door. Liza gave a little cry, and the woman said, with a sneer, "'You didn't expect to see me, did you?' Liza did not answer, but tried to walk past her. Mrs. Blakeston stepped forward and blocked her way. "'You seem to be in a mighty fine hurry,' she said. "'Yes, I've got to get home,' said Liza, again trying to pass. "'But supposing I don't let you,' remarked Mrs. Blakeston, preventing her from moving. "'Why don't you leave me alone?' Liza said. "'I ain't interfering with you.' "'Not interfering with me, aren't you?' I like that. Let me go by, said Liza. I don't want to talk to you. Now, nah, I know that, said the other, but I want to talk to you, and I shan't let you go until I've said what I want to say. Liza looked round for help. At the beginning of the altercation, the loafers about the public house had looked up with interest, and gradually gathered round in a circle. Passers-by had joined in, and a number of other people in the street, seeing the crowd, added themselves to it to see what was going on. Liza saw that all eyes were fixed on her, the men amused and excited, the woman unsympathetic, rather virtuously indignant. Liza wanted to ask for help, but there were so many people, and they all seemed so much against her, that she had not the courage to. So, having surveyed the crowd, she turned her eyes to Mrs. Blakeston, and stood in front of her, trembling a little, and very white. "'Nah, he ain't here,' said Mrs. Blakeston sneeringly, "'so you needn't look for him.' "'I don't know what you mean,' answered Liza, "'and I want to go away.' I ain't done nothing to you. Not done nothing to me, furiously repeated the woman. I'll tell you what you've done to me. You've robbed me of my husband, you have. I've never had a word with my husband until you took him from me. And now it's all you with him. He's got no time for his wife and family. It's all you. And, and his money too. I never get a penny of it. If it weren't for the little bit I'd saved up in the saving bank, me and my children would be starving now. And all through you. She shook her fist at her. I never had any money from anyone. Don't talk to me, I know you did, you dirty bitch. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, taking a married man from his family, and him old enough to be your father. She's right there, said one or two of the onlooking women. There can't be no good in her if she takes somebody else's husband. I'll give it you, proceeded Mrs. Blakeston, getting more hot and excited, brandishing her fist, and speaking in a loud voice, hoarse with rage. Oh, I've been trying to get old on you this four weeks. Why, you're a prostitute, that's what you are. I'm not, answered Liza indignantly. Yes, you are, repeated Mrs. Blakeston, advancing menacingly, so Liza shrank back. And what's more, he treats you like one. I know he'll give you that black eye. That shows what he thinks of you. And serve you blooming well right if he'd give you one in both eyes. Mrs. Blakeston stood close in front of her, her heavy jaw protruded, and the frown of her eyebrows dark and stern. For a moment she stood silent, contemplating Liza, while the surrounders looked on in breathless interest. "'You dirty little bitch, you,' she said at last. "'Take that.' With her open hand, she gave her a sharp smack on the cheek. Liza started back with a cry and put her hand up to her face. "'And take that,' added Mrs. Blakeston, repeating the blow. Gathering up the spittle in her mouth, she spat in Liza's face. Liza sprang on her, and with her hands spread out like claws, buried her nails in the woman's face and drew them down her cheeks. Mrs. Blakeston caught hold of her hair with both hands, and tugged at it as hard as she could. But they were immediately separated. Here, old art, said some of the men. Fight her out fair and square. Don't go scratching and mauling like that. I'll fight her. I don't mind, shouted Mrs. Blakeston, tucking up her sleeves and savagely glaring at her opponent. 
Liza stood in front of her, pale and trembling, as she looked at her enemy and saw the long red marks of her nails with blood coming from one or two of them. She shrank back. I don't want to fight, she said hoarsely. No, I don't suppose you do, hissed the other, but you're damn well after. She's ever so much bigger than me, I've got no chance, added Liza tearfully. You should have thought of that before, come on. And with these words, Mrs. Blakeston rushed upon her. She hit her with both fists, one after the other. Liza did not try to guard herself, but imitating the woman's motion, hit out with her own fists, and for a minute or two they continued thus, raining blows on one another with the same windmill motion of the arm. But Liza could not stand against the other woman's weight. The blows came down heavy and rapid all over her face and head. She put up her hands to cover her face and turned her head away, while Mrs. Blakeston kept on hitting mercilessly. Time, shouted some of the men, time, and Mrs. Blakeston stopped to rest herself. It don't seem hardly fair to set them two on together. Liza's got no chance against a big woman like that, said a man among the crowd. Well, it's her own fault, answered a woman. She didn't ought to mess about with her husband. Well, I don't think it's right, added another man. She's getting it too much. And serve her right too, said one of the women. She deserves all she gets, and a damn sight more into the bargain. Quite right, put in a third. A woman's got no right to take someone's husband from her. And if she does, she's bloomin' lucky if she gets off with her hiding. That's what I think. So do I, but I wouldn't have thought it of Liza. I never thought she was a wrong one. Pretty specimen she is, said a little dark woman, who looked like a Jewess. If she messed about with my old man, I'd stick her. I swear I would. Now she's been carrying on with one, she'll try and get others. You see if she don't. She'd better not come round my house. I'll soon give her what for. Meanwhile, Liza was standing at one corner of the ring, trembling all over and crying bitterly. One of her eyes was bunged up, and her hair, all dishevelled, was hanging down over her face. Two young fellows, who had constituted themselves her seconds, were standing in front of her, offering rather ironical comfort. One of them had taken the bottom corners of her apron and was fanning her with it, while the other was showing her how to stand and hold her arms. You stand up to Eliza, he was saying. There ain't no good funk in it. You'll simply get it all the worse. You give it her back. Give her one on the boco like this, see? You must show a bit of pluck, you know. Eliza tried to check her sobs. Yes, it are hard, that's what you've got to do, said the other. And if you find she's getting the better on you, you close on her and catch hold of her hair and scratch her. You've marked her with your nails, Liza. By gosh, you did fly on her when she span at you. That's the way to do the job. Then turning to his fellow, he said, Do you remember that fight as old Mother Craig had with another woman in the street last year? Nah, he answered. I never saw that. It was a corker, and the cops come in and took them both off to quad. Liza wished the policeman would come and take her off. She would willingly have gone to prison to escape the fiend in front of her, but no help came. Time's up, shouted the referee. Fire away. Take care of the cops, shouted a man. There's no fear about them, answered somebody else. They always keep us out of the way when there's anything going on. Fire away. Mrs. Blakeston attacked Liza madly, but the girl stood up bravely, and as well as she could gave back the blows she received. The spectators grew tremendously excited. Got him again, they shouted. Give it, Eliza, that's a good un. Hit her hard. Two to one on the old un, shouted a sporting gentleman, but Eliza found no backers. Ain't she standing up well, now she's roused, cried someone. Oh, she's got pluck in her, she has. That's a knockout, they shouted, as Mrs. Blakeston brought her fist down onto Eliza's nose. The girl staggered back, and blood began to flow. Then, losing all fear, mad with rage, she made a rush on her enemy and rained down blows all over her nose and eyes and mouth. The woman recoiled at the sudden violence of the onslaught, and the men cried, By God, the little one's getting the best of it! But quickly recovering herself, the woman closed with Liza and dug her nails into her flesh. Liza caught hold of her hair and pulled with all her might, turning her teeth on Mrs. Blakeston, tried to bite her. And thus for a minute they swayed about, scratching, tearing, biting, sweat and blood pouring down their faces, and their eyes fixed on one another, bloodshot and full of rage. The audience shouted and cheered and clapped their hands. What the hell's up here? I say, look there, said some of the women, in a whisper. It's the husband. He stood on tiptoe and looked over the crowd. My God, he said, it's Liza. Then roughly pushing the people aside, he made his way through the crowd into the centre, thrusting himself between the two women, tore them apart. He turned furiously on his wife. 
By God, I'll give you something for this. For a moment they all three stood silently looking at one another. Another man had been attracted by the crowd, and he too pushed his way through. Come home, Liza, he said. Tom. He took hold of her arm and led her through the people, who gave way to let her pass. They walked silently through the street, Tom very grave, Liza weeping bitterly. Oh, Tom, she sobbed after a while. I couldn't help it. Then, when her tears permitted, I do love him so. When they got to the door, she plaintively said, Come in, and he followed her to her room. Here she sank onto a chair and gave herself up to her tears. Tom wetted the end of a towel and began wiping her face, grimy with blood and tears. She let him do it, just moaning amid her sobs. You are good to me, Tom. Cheer up, old gal, he said kindly. It's all over now. After a while, the excess of crying brought its cessation. She drank some water, and then taking up a broken hand glass, she looked at herself, saying, I am a sight and proceeded to wind up her hair. You have been good to me, Tom, she repeated, her voice still broken with sobs, and as he sat down beside her, she took his hand. No, I ain't, he said. It's only what anybody would have done. You know, Tom, she said after a little silence, I'm so sorry I spoke cross like when I met you in the street. You ain't spoke to me since. Oh, that's all over now, lady. We needn't think of that. Oh, but I have treated you bad. I'm a regular wrong and I am. He pressed her hand without speaking. I say, Tom, she began after another pause. Did you know that? Well, you know, before today. He blushed as he answered. Yes. She spoke very sadly and slowly. I thought you did. You seemed so cut up when I used to meet you. You did love me then, Tom, didn't you? I do now, dearie, he answered. Ah, oh, it's too late now, she sighed. Do you know, Liza, he said, I'm just about kicked the life out of a fella because he said you was messing about with, with him. And you knew I was? Yes, but I wasn't going to have anyone say it before me. They've all rounded on me except you, Tom. I'd have done better if I'd taken you when you asked me. I shouldn't be where I am now if I had. Well, won't you now? Won't you have me now? Me? After what's happened? Oh, I don't mind about that. That don't matter to me if you'll marry me. I fair can't live without you, Eliza, won't you? She groaned. No, I can't, Tom. It wouldn't be right. Why not, if I don't mind? Tom, she said, looking down, almost whispering. I'm like that, you know? What do you mean? She could scarcely utter the words. I think I'm in the family way. He paused a moment, then spoke again. Well, I don't mind, if you'll only marry me. No, I can't, Tom, she said, bursting into tears. I can't, but you are so good to me. I'd do anything to make it up to you. She put her arms round his neck and slid onto his knees. You know, Tom, I couldn't marry you now. But anything else, if he wants me to do anything else, I'll do it if it'll make you happy. He did not understand, but only said, You're a good gal, Liza. And bending down, he kissed her gravely on the forehead. Then with a sigh, he lifted her down, and getting up, left her alone. For a while, she sat where he left her. But as she thought of all she had gone through, her loneliness and misery overcame her. The tears welled forth, and throwing herself on the bed, she buried her face in the pillow. Jim stood looking at Liza as she went off with Tom, and his wife watched him jealously. It's her you're thinking about. Of course you'd have liked to take her home yourself. I know, and leave me to shift for myself. Shut up, said Jim, angrily turning on her. I shan't shut up, she answered, raising her voice. Nice husband you are. God, lummy, as good as they make em. Nice thing to go and leave your wife and children for a thing like that, at your age too. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Why, it's like messing about with your own daughter. By God, he ground his teeth with rage. If you don't leave me alone, I'll kick the life out of you. There, she said, turning to the crowd. There, see how he treats me. Listen to that. I've been his wife for twenty years, and you couldn't have had a better wife. And I bore him nine children yet say nothing of a miscarriage, and I've got another coming, and that's how he treats me. Nice husband, ain't it? She looked at him scornfully, then again at the surrounders, as if for their opinion. Well, I'm going to stay here all night, get out of the light. He pushed aside the people who barred his way, and the one or two who growled a little at his roughness, looking at his angry face, were afraid to complain. Look at him, said his wife. He's afraid he is. See him slinking away like a blooming mongrel with his tail between his legs. Ugh! 
She walked just behind him, shouting and brandishing her arms. You dirty beast, you, she yelled, to go fooling about with a little girl. Ah, I wish she wasn't my husband. I wouldn't be seen drowned with you if I could help it. You make me sick to look at you. The crowd followed them on both sides of the road, keeping at a discreet distance, but still eagerly listening. Jim turned on her once or twice and said, Shut up. But it only made her more angry. I tell you, I shan't shut up. I don't care who knows it. You're a... You are... You're a... And you are. I'm ashamed the children should have such a father as you. Do you think I didn't know what you was up to them nights you was away? Courting? Yes, courting. You're a nice man, you are. Jim did not answer her, but walked on. At last he turned round to the people who were following and said, Now then, what do you want here? You jolly well clear, or I'll give some of you something. They were mostly boys and women, and at his words they shrank back. He's afraid to say anything to me, jeered Mrs. Blakeston. He's a beauty. Jim entered his house, and she followed him till they came up into their room. Polly was giving the children their tea. They all started up as they saw their mother with her hair and clothes in disorder, blotches of dried blood on her face, and the long scratch marks. Oh, mother, said Polly, what is the matter? He's the matter, she answered, pointing to her husband. It's through him I've got all this. Look at your father, children. He's a father to be proud of leaving it to starve and spending his week's money on a dirty little strump. Jim felt easier now. He had not got so many strange eyes on him. Now look here, he said. I'm not going to stand this much longer, so just you take care. I ain't afraid of you. I know you'd like to kill me, but you'll get strung up if you do. No, I won't kill you, but if I have any more of your sauce, I'll do the next thing to it. Touch me if you dare, she said. I'll have the law on you, and I shouldn't mind how many months old you got. Be quiet, he said, and closing his hand, gave her a heavy blow in the chest that made her stagger. Oh, you, she screamed. She seized the poker, and in a fury of rage, rushed at him. Would you, he said, catching hold of it, and wrenching it from her grasp. He threw it to the end of the room and grappled with her. For a moment, they swayed about from side to side. Then, with an effort, he lifted her off her feet and threw her to the ground. But she caught hold of him, and he came down on top of her. She screamed as her head thumped the floor, and the children, who were standing huddled up in a corner, terrified, screamed too. Jim caught hold of his wife's head and began beating it against the floor. She cried out, You're killing me! Help! Help! Polly in terror ran up to her father and tried to pull him off. Father, don't hit her! Anything but that, for God's sake! Leave me alone, he said, or I'll give you something too. She caught hold of his arm, but Jim, still kneeling on his wife, gave Polly a backhanded blow which sent her staggering back. Take that. Polly ran out of the room, downstairs to the first floor front, where two men and two women were sitting at tea. Oh, come and stop father, she cried. He's killing mother. Why, what's he doing? Oh, he's got her on the floor, and he's banging her head. He's paying her out for giving Liza Kemp a hiding. One of the women started up and said to her husband, Come on, John, you go and stop it. Don't you, John, said the other man. When a man's given his wife socks, it's best not to interfere. But he's killing her, repeated Polly, trembling with fright. Gone, rejoined the man. She'll get over it. And perhaps she deserves it too, for all you know. John sat undecided, looking now at Polly, now at his wife, and now at the other man. I'll do be quick, for God's sake, said Polly. At that moment, a sound as of something smashing was heard upstairs, and a woman's shriek. Mrs. Blakeston, in an effort to tear herself away from her husband, had knocked up against the washhand stand, and the whole thing had crashed down. Go on, John, said the wife. No, I ain't going. I shan't do no good, and it'll only round on me. Well, you are a blooming lot of cowards, that's all I can say, indignantly answered the wife. But I ain't going to see a woman murdered. I'll go and stop him. With that, she ran upstairs and threw open the door. Jim was still kneeling on his wife, hitting her furiously, while she was trying to protect her head and face with her hands. Leave off, shouted the woman. Jim looked up. Who the devil are you, he said. Leave off, I tell you. Aren't you ashamed of yourself knocking a woman about like that? And she sprang at him, seizing his fist. Let go, he said, or I'll give you a bit. You'd better not touch me, she said, you dirty coward. Why, look at her, she's almost senseless. Jim stopped and gazed at his wife. He got up and gave her a kick. Get up, he said. She remained huddled on the floor, 
moaning feebly. The woman from downstairs went on her knees and took her head in her arms. Never mind, Mrs. Blakeston. He's not going to touch her. Here, drink this little drop of water. Then, turning to Jim with infinite disdain, you dirty blackguard you. If I was a man, I'd give you something for this. Jim put on his hat and went out, slamming the door, while the woman shouted after him, Good riddance. Lord love you, said Mrs. Kemp. What is the matter? She had just come in, and opening the door, had started back in surprise at seeing Liza on the bed, all tears. Liza made no answer, but cried as if her heart were breaking. Mrs. Kemp went up to her and tried to look at her face. Don't cry, dearie. Tell us what it is. Liza sat up and dried her eyes. I am so unhappy. What have you been doing to your face? My, nothing. Go on, you can't have a face like that all by itself. I had a bit of a scrimmage with a woman down the street, sobbed out Liza. She's as give you a doing, and you're all upset, and look at your eye. I brought in a little bit of steak for tomorrow's dinner. You just cut a bit off and put it over your optic. That'll soon put it right. I always used to do that myself when me and your poor father had words. Oh, I'm all over in a tremble, and my head, oh, my head does feel bad. I know what you want, remarked Mrs. Camp, nodding her head, and it so happens I've got the very thing with me. She pulled a medicine bottle out of her pocket, and taking out the cork, smelt it. That's good stuff. None of your fire water or your methylated spirit. I don't often indulge in such things, but when I do, I likes to have the best. She handed the bottle to Liza, who took a mouthful, and gave it her back. She had a drink herself, and smacked her lips. That's good stuff. Have a drop more. Nah, said Liza. I ain't used to drinking spirits. She felt dumb and miserable and a heavy pain throbbed through her head, if she could only forget. Now nah, I know you're not, but bless your soul, that won't hurt you. It'll do you no end of good. Why, often when I've been feeling that done up, that I didn't know what to do with myself, I've just had a little drop of whiskey or gin. I'm not particular what spirit it is, and it's pulled me up wonderful. Liza took another sip, a slightly longer one. It burnt as it went down her throat, and sent through her a feeling of comfortable warmth. warmth. I really do think it's doing me good, she said, wiping her eyes and giving a sigh of relief as the crying ceased. I knew it would. I'd take my word for it. If people took a little drop of spirits in time, there'd be much less sickness about. They sat for a while in silence. Then Mrs. Kemp remarked, You know, Liza, it strikes me as how we could do with a drop more. You not being in the habit of taking anything, I only just brought this little drop for me, and it ain't took us long to finish that up. But as you're an invalid, like we'll get a little more this time. It's sure to turn out useful. But you ain't got nothing to put it in. Yes, I have, answered Mrs. Kemp. There's that bottle as they gives me at the hospital. Just empty the medicine out into the pile and wash it out, and I'll take it round to the pub myself. Liza, when she was left alone, began to turn things over in her mind. She did not feel so utterly unhappy as before, for the things she had gone through seemed further away. After all, she said, it doesn't so much matter. Mrs. Kemp came in. Have a little drop more, Liza, she said. Well, I don't mind if I do. I'll get some tumblers, shall I? There's no mistake about it, she added, when she had taken little. It do buck you up. You're right, Liza, you're right, and you wanted it badly. Fancy you having a fight with a woman. Oh, I've had some in my day, but then I wasn't a little bit of a thing like you is. I wish I'd been there. I wouldn't have stood by and looked on while my daughter was getting the worst of it. Although I'm turned 65 and getting on for 66, I'd have said to her, if you touch my daughter, you'll have me to deal with, so just look out. She brandished her glass, and that reminding her, she refilled it and Liza's. Ah, Liza, she remarked, you're a chip off the old block. To see you sitting there and having your little drop, it makes me feel as if I was living a better life. You used to be rather hard on me, Liza, because I took a little drop on Saturday nights. And mind... I don't say I didn't take a little drop too much sometimes. Accidents will occur even in the best regulated of families. But what I say is this. It's good stuff. I say, and it don't hurt you. Buck up, old gal, said Liza, filling the glasses. No eel taps. I feel like a new woman now. I was that down in the dumps. Well, I shouldn't have cared if I'd been at the bottom of the river. And that's the truth. You don't say so, replied her affectionate mother. Yes, I do, and I mean it too but I don't feel like that now. You're right, mother. When you're in trouble, there's nothing like a bit of spirit. Well, if I don't know, I don't know who does. For the trouble I've had, it'd be enough to kill many women. Well, I've had 13 children, 
and you can think what that was. Every one I had, I used to say I wouldn't have no more. But one does, you know. You'll have a family some day, Liza. I shouldn't wonder if you didn't have as many as me. We come from a very prodigal family, we do. We've all gone into double figures, except your Aunt Mary, who only had three. But then she wasn't married, so it didn't count, like. They drank each other's health. Everything was getting blurred to Liza. She was losing her head. Yes, went on Mrs. Kemp. I've had thirteen children, and I'm proud of it. As your poor dear father used to say, it shows us how one gets the blood of a Briton in one. Your poor dear father, he was a great hand at speaking, he was. He used to speak at parliamentary meetings. I really believe he'd have been a member of parliament if he'd been alive now. Well, as I was saying, your father used to say, none of your small families for me. I don't approve of them, says he. He was a man of very high principles, and by politics he was a radical. No, says he, when he got talking. When a man can have a family rising into double figures, it shows he's got the backbone of a Briton in him. That's the stuff has built up England's name and glory. When one thinks of the mighty British Empire, says he, on which the sun never sets from morning till night, one has to be proud of himself, and one has to do one's duty in that walk of life in which it pleased Providence to set one. And every man's first duty is to get as many children as he bloomin' well can. Lord love you, he could talk, I can tell you. Drink up, mother, said Liza. You're not half drinking. She flourished the bottle. I don't care a two-penny hang for all them blokes. I'm quite happy and I don't want anything else. I can see you're my daughter now, said Mrs. Kemp. When he used to round on me, I used to think as how if I hadn't carried you for nine months, it must have been some mistake and it wasn't my daughter at all. When you come to think of it, a man, he don't know if it's his child or somebody else's. But you can't deceive a woman like that. You couldn't palm off somebody else's kid on her. I am beginning to feel quite lively, said Liza. I don't know what it is, but I feel as if I wanted to laugh till I fairly split my sides. And she began to sing, For he's a jolly good fella, for he's a jolly good fella. Her dress was all disarranged, her face covered the scars of scratches, and clots of blood had fixed under her nose. Her eye had swollen up so that it was nearly closed and red. Her hair was hanging over her face and shoulders, and she laughed stupidly and leered with heavy, sodden ugliness. Dizzy, dizzy, I can't afford a carriage, but you'll look neat on the seat of a bicycle made for two. She shouted out the tunes, beating time on the table, and her mother, grinning with her thin grey hair hanging dishevelled over her head, joined in with her weak, cracked voice. O oh, dem golden kippers o. Oh. Then Liza grew more melancholy and broke into old Lang Syne. Should the old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind? For old Lang Syne. Finally, they both grew silent, and in a little while there came a snore from Mrs. Kemp. Her head fell forward to her chest. Liza tumbled from her chair onto the bed, and sprawling across it, fell asleep. Although I am drunk and bad, be you kind. Cast a glance at this heart, which is bewildered and distressed. O oh God, take away from my mind my cry and my complaint. Offer wine, and take sorrow from my remembrance. Offer wine. End of chapter 11。Chapter 12 of Liza of Lambeth by W. Somerset Maugham。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hatton 43. Log de la quinzaine.wordpress.com About the middle of the night, Liza woke. Her mouth was hot and dry, and a sharp, cutting pain passed through her head as she moved. Her mother had evidently roused herself, for she was lying in bed by her side, partially undressed, with all the bedclothes rolled round her. Liza shivered in the cold night, and taking off some of her things, her boots, her skirt and jacket, got right into bed. She tried to get some of the blanket from her mother, but as she pulled, Mrs. Kemp gave a growl in her sleep and drew the clothes more tightly round her. So Liza put over herself her skirt and a shawl, which was lying over the end of the bed, and tried to go to sleep. But she could not. Her head and hands were broiling hot, and she was terribly thirsty. When she lifted herself up to get a drink of water, such a pang went through her head that she fell back on the bed groaning, and lay there with a beating heart and strange pains that she did not know went through her. Then a cold shiver seemed to rise in the very marrow of her bones, and run down every artery and vein, freezing the blood. Her skin puckered up, 
and drawing up her legs, she lay huddled together in a heap, the shawl wrapped tightly round her, and her teeth chattering. Shivering, she whispered, Oh, I'm so cold, so cold. Mother, give me some clothes. I shall die of the cold. Oh, I'm freezing. But after a while, the cold seemed to give way, and a sudden heat seized her, flushing her face, making her break out into perspiration, so that she threw everything off and loosened the things about her neck. Give us a drink, she said, or I'd give anything for a little drop of water. There was no one to hear. Mrs. Kemp continued to sleep heavily, occasionally breaking out into a little snore. Liza remained there, now shivering with cold, now panting for breath, listening to the regular, heavy breathing by her side, and in her pain she sobbed. She pulled at her pillow and said, Why can't I go to sleep? Why can't I sleep like her? And the darkness was awful. It was a heavy, ghastly blackness that seemed palpable, so that it frightened her, and she looked for relief at the faint light glimmering through the window from a distant street lamp. She thought the night would never end. The minutes seemed like hours, and she wondered how she should live through till morning, and strange pains that she did not know went through her. Still, the night went on. The darkness continued, cold and horrible, and her mother breathed loudly and steadily by her side. At last, with the morning, sleep came, but the sleep was almost worse than the wakefulness, for it was accompanied by ugly, disturbing dreams. Liza thought she was going through the fight with her enemy, and Mrs. Blakeston grew enormous in size and multiplied, so that every way she turned the figure confronted her, and she began running away, and she ran and ran till she found herself reckoning up an account. She had puzzled over in the morning, and she did it backwards and forwards, upwards and downwards, starting here, starting there, and the figures got mixed up with other things, and she had to begin over again, and everything jumbled up, and her head whirled, till finally, with a start, she woke. The darkness had given way to a cold grey dawn, her uncovered legs were chilled to the bone, and by her side she heard again the regular, nasal breathing of the drunkard. For a long while she lay where she was, feeling very sick and ill, but better than in the night. At last her mother woke. Liza, she called. Yes, mother, she answered feebly. Get us a cup of tea, will you? I can't, mother, I'm ill. Go on, said Mrs. Kemp in surprise. Then looking at her, Swap me, Bob, what's up with you? Why, your cheeks is flushed, and your forehead it is hot. What's the matter with you, girl? I don't know, said Liza. I've been that bad all night. I thought I was going to die. I know what it is, said Mrs. Kemp, shaking her head. The fact is, you ain't used to drinking, and of course it's upset you. Now me, why, I'm as fresh as a daisy. Take my word, there ain't no good in teetotalism. It finds you out in the end, and it's found you out. Mrs. Kemp considered it a judgment of providence. She got up and mixed some whiskey and water. Here, drink this, she said. When one's had a drop too much at night, there's nothing like having a drop more in the morning to put one right. It just acts like magic. Take it away, said Liza, turning from it in disgust. The smell of it gives me the sick. I'll never touch spirits again. Ah, that's what we all says sometime in our lives. But we does. And what's more, we can't do without it. Why me, the hard life I've had. It is unnecessary to repeat Mrs. Kemp's repetitions. Liza did not get up all day. Tom came to inquire after her, and was told she was very ill. Liza plaintively asked whether anyone else had been, and sighed a little when her mother answered no. But she felt too ill to think much or trouble much about anything. The fever came again as the day wore on, and the pains in her head grew worse. Her mother came to bed, and quickly went off to sleep, leaving Liza to bear her agony alone. She began to have frightful pains all over her, and she held her breath to prevent herself from crying out and waking her mother. She clutched the sheets in her agony, and at last, about six o'clock in the morning, she could bear it no longer, and in the anguish of labour screamed out and woke her mother. Mrs. Kemp was frightened out of her wits. Going upstairs, she woke the woman who lived on the floor above her. Without hesitating, the good lady put on a skirt and came down. She's had a miss, she said, after looking at Liza. Is there anyone you could send to the hospital? No, I don't know who I could get at this hour. Well, I'll get me old man to go. So she called her husband and sent him off. 
She was a stout, middle-aged woman, rough-visaged and strong-armed. Her name was Mrs. Hodges. It's lucky you came to me, she said, when she had settled down. I go out nursing, you know, so I know all about it. Well, you surprise me, said Mrs. Kemp. I didn't know as Liza was that way. She never told me nothing about it. Do you know who it is as done it? Now you ask me something I don't know, replied Mrs. Kemp. But now I come to think of it, it must be that there Tom. He's been keeping company with Liza. He's a single man, so they'll be able to get married. That's something. It ain't Tom, feebly said Liza. Not him. Who is it then? Liza did not answer. Eh? repeated the mother. Who is it? Liza lay still without speaking. Never mind, Mrs. Kemp, said Mrs. Hodges. Don't worry her now. You'll be able to find out all about it when she gets better. For a while, the two women sat still, waiting the doctor's coming, and Liza lay gazing vacantly at the wall, panting for breath. Sometimes Jim crossed her mind, and she opened her mouth to call for him, but in her despair she restrained herself. The doctor came. Do you think she's bad, doctor? asked Mrs. Hodges. I'm afraid she is, rather, he answered. I'll come in again this evening. Oh, doctor, said Mrs. Kemp as he was going, could you give me something for my rheumatics? I'm a martyr to rheumatism, and these cold days hardly knows what to do with myself. And doctor, could you let me have some beef tea? My husband's dead, and of course I can't do no work with my daughter ill like this, and we're very short. The day passed, and in the evening Mrs. Hodges, who had been attending to her own domestic duties, came downstairs again. Mrs. Kemp was on the bed sleeping. I was just having a little nap to Mrs. Hodges on waking. How was the girl? asked the lady. Oh, answered Mrs. Kemp, my rheumatics has been that bad I really haven't known what to do with myself, and now Liza can't rub me on worse than ever. It's unfortunate that she should get ill just now, when I want so much attending to myself, but there, it's just my luck. Mrs. Hodges went over and looked at Liza. She was lying just as when she left in the morning, her cheeks flushed, her mouth open for breath, and tiny beads of sweat stood on her forehead. How are you, ducky? asked Mrs. Hodges, but Liza did not answer. It's my belief she's unconscious, said Mrs. Kemp. I've been asking her who it was has done it, but she don't seem to hear what I say. It's been a great shock to me, Mrs. Hodges. I believe you, replied the lady sympathetically. When you come in and said what it was, you might have knocked me down with a feather. I knew no more than the dead what had happened. I saw at once what it was, said Mrs. Hodges, nodding her head. Yes, of course you knew. I expect you've had a great deal of practice one way and another. You're right, Mrs. Kemp, you're right. I've been on the job now for nearly twenty years, and if I don't know something about it, I ought. Do you find it pays well? Well, Mrs. Kemp, take it all in all. I ain't got no grounds for complaint. I'm in the habit of asking five shillings, and I will say this. I don't think it's too much for what I do. The news of Liza's illness had quickly spread, and more than once in the course of the day, a neighbour had come to ask after her. There was a knock at the door now, and Mrs. Hodges opened it. Tom stood on the threshold, asking to come in. Yes, you can come, said Mrs. Kemp. He advanced on tiptoe, so as to make no noise, but for a while stood silently looking at Liza. Mrs. Hodges was by his side. Can I speak to her? he whispered. She can't hear you. He groaned. Do you think she'll get all right? he asked. Mrs. Hodges shrugged her shoulders. I shouldn't like to give an opinion, she said cautiously. Tom bent over Liza and, blushing, kissed her, then, without speaking further, went out of the room. That's the young man as was courting her, said Mrs. Kemp, pointing over her shoulder with her thumb. Soon after, the doctor came. What do you think of her, doctor? said Mrs. Hodges, bustling forwards authoritatively, in her position of midwife and sick nurse. I'm afraid she's very bad. Do you think she's going to die? she asked, dropping her voice to a whisper. I'm afraid so. As the doctor sat down by Liza's side, Mrs. Hodges turned round and significantly nodded to Mrs. Kemp, who put her handkerchief to her eyes. Then she went outside to the little group waiting at the door. What does the doctor say? they asked, among them Tom. He says just what I've been saying all along. I knew she wouldn't live. And Tom burst out. Oh, Liza. As she retired, a woman remarked, Mrs. Hodges is very clever, I think. Yes, remarked another. 
She got me through my last confinement simply wonderful. If it comes to choosing between them, I'd back Mrs. Hodges against forty doctors. To tell you the truth, so would I. I've never known her wrong yet. Mrs. Hodges sat down beside Mrs. Kemp and proceeded to comfort her. Why don't you take a little drop of brandy to calm your nerves, Mrs. Kemp, she said. You want it. I was just feeling rather faint, and I couldn't help thinking as how two penneth of whiskey would do me good. Now, nah, Mrs. Kemp, said Mrs. Hodges earnestly, putting her hand on the other's arm. You take my tip. When you're queer, there's nothing like brandy for pulling it together. Don't object to whiskey myself, but as a medicine, you can't beat brandy. Well, I won't set up myself knowing better than you, Mrs. Hodges. I'll do what you think right. Quite accidentally, there was some in the room, and Mrs. Kemp pulled it out for herself and her friend. I'm not in the habit of taking anything when I'm out on business, she apologised. But just to keep you company, I don't mind if I do. Your health, Mrs. Hodges. Same to you, and thank you, Mrs. Kemp. Liza lay still, breathing very quietly, her eyes closed. The doctor kept his fingers on her pulse. I've been very unfortunate of light, remarked Mrs. Hodges as she licked her lips. This makes the second death I've had in the last ten days. Woman, I mean, of course. I don't count babies. You don't say so. Of course, the other one. Well, she was only a prostitute, so it didn't so much matter. It ain't like another woman, is it? No, you're right. Still, one don't like them to die, even if they are that. One mustn't be too hard on them. Strikes me you've got a very kind aunt, Mrs. Hodges, said Mrs. Kemp. I have that, and I often says it'd be better for my peace of mind and my business if I hadn't. I have to go through a lot. I do. But I can say this for myself. I always give satisfaction, and that's something as all ladies in my line can't say. They sip their brandy for a while. It's a great trial to me that this should have happened, said Mrs. Kemp coming to the subject that had been disturbing her for some time. Mine's always been a very respectable family, and such a thing as this has never happened before. No, Mrs. Hodges, I was lawfully married in the church, and I've got my license, and I've got my marriage lines to show I was, and that one of my daughters should have gone wrong in this way. Well, I can't understand it. I give her a good education, and she had all the comforts of her home. She never wanted for nothing. I worked myself to the bone to keep her in luxury, and then that she could go and disgrace me like this. I understand what you mean, Mrs. Kent. I can tell you, my family was very respectable, and my husband, he earned 25 shillings a week, and was in the same place 17 years, and his employers sent a very beautiful wreath to put on his coffin, and they tell me they never had such a good workman and such an honest man before. And me? Well, I can say this. I've done my duty by the girl, She's never learnt anything but good from me. Of course, I ain't always been in what you call flourishing circumstances, but I've always set her a good example, as she could tell you so herself, if she wasn't speechless. Mrs. Kemp paused for a moment's reflection. As they say in the Bible, she finished, it's enough to make one's grey hairs go down into the ground in sorrow. I can show you my marriage certificate, of course, one doesn't like to say much, but of course, she's very bad. But if she got well, I should have given her a talk in her. There was another knock. Do go and see who that is. I can't, on account of my rheumatics. Mrs. Hodges opened the door. It was Jim. He was very white, and the blackness of his hair and beard, contrasting with the deathly pallor of his face, made him look ghastly. Mrs. Hodges stepped back. Who's he? she said, turning to Mrs. Kemp. Jim pushed her aside and went up to the bed. Doctor, is she very bad? he asked. The doctor looked at him questioningly. Jim whispered, it was me as done it. She ain't going to die, is she? The doctor nodded. Oh God, what shall I do? It was my fault. I wish I was dead. Jim took the girl's head in his hands and the tears burst from his eyes. She ain't dead yet, is she? She's just living, said the doctor. Jim bent down. Liza, Liza, speak to me. Liza, say you forgive me. Oh, speak to me. His voice was full of agony. The doctor spoke. She can't hear you. Oh, she must hear me. Liza, Liza. He sank on his knees by the bedside. They all remained silent. Liza lying stiller than ever, her breast unmoved by the feeble respiration. Jim, looking at her very mournfully, the doctor grave with his fingers on the pulse. 
The two women looked at Jim. Fancy it being him, said Mrs. Kemp. Strike me lucky, ain't he a sight? You have got her insured, Mrs. Kemp, said the midwife. She could bear the silence no longer. Trust me for that, replied the good lady. I've had her insured ever since she was born. Why, the only other day I was saying to myself that all that money had been wasted. But you see it wasn't. You never know your luck, you see. Quite right. I'm a rare one for insuring. It's a great thing. I've always insured all my children. The way I look on it is this, said Mrs. Kemp. Whatever you do when they're alive, and we all know as children is very trying sometimes, you should give them a good funeral when they die. That's my motto, and I've always acted up to it. Do you deal with Mr. Stearman? asked Mrs. Hodges. No, Mrs. Hodges, for undertaking give me Mr. Footley every time. In the black line he's first, and the rest nowhere. Well, that's very strange now. That's just what I think. Mr. Footley does his work well, and he's very reasonable. I'm a very old customer of his, and he lets me have things cheap as anybody. Does he indeed? Well, Mrs. Hodges, if I ain't asking too much of you, I should look upon it as very kind if you'd go and make the arrangements for Liza. Why, certainly, Mrs. Kemp. I'm always willing to do a good turn to anybody if I can. I want it done very respectable, said Mrs. Kemp. I'm not going to stint for nothing for my daughter's funeral. I like plumes, you know, although they is a bit extra. Never you fear, Mrs. Kemp. It should be done as well as if it was for my own husband, and I can't say more than that. Mr. Footley thinks a deal of me, he does. Why, only the other day, as I was going into his shop, he says, Good morning, Mrs. Hodges. Good morning, Mr. Footley, says I. You've just come in the nick of time, says he. This gentleman and myself, pointing to another gentleman, as was standing there, and myself, say I, I gives you all the work I can. I believe you, says he. Well, he says, now which do you think? Does Oak look better than Helm, or does Helm look better than Oak? Oak versus Helm, that's the question. Well, Mrs. Footley, says I, for my own private opinion, when you've got a nice brass plate in the middle, and nice brass handles each end, there's nothing like, like Oak. Quite right, says he. That's what I think. For the coffins give me the hoke any day, and I hope, says he, when the Lord sees fit to call me to himself, I shall be put in a hoke coffin myself. Amen, says I. I like hoke, said Mrs. Kemp. My poor husband, he had a hoke coffin. We did have a job with him, I can tell you. You know he had dropsy, and he swell up. Oh, he did swell. His own mother wouldn't have known him. Why, his legs swell up, till it was as big as it was as big round as his body. Swap me Bob, it did. Did it indeed, ejaculated Mrs. Hodges. Yes, and when he died they sent the coffin up. I didn't have Mr. Footley at that time. We didn't live here then. We lived in Battersea, and all our undertaking was done by Mr. Browning. Well, he sent the coffin up. We got my old man in, but we couldn't get the lid down. He was so swell. Well, Mr. Browning, he was a great big man, thirteen stone if he was an ounce. But he stood on the coffin, and a young man he had with him stood on it too, and the lid simply wouldn't go down. So Mr. Browning, he said, jump on, missus. So I was in my widow's weeds, you know, but we had to get it down. So I stood on it, and we all jumped, and at last we got it too, and screwed it. But law we did have a job. I shall never forget it. Then all was silence, and a heaviness seemed to fill the air like a grey blight, cold and suffocating and the heaviness was death. They felt the presence in the room, and they dared not move. They dared not draw their breath. The silence was terrifying. Suddenly a sound was heard, a loud rattle. It was from the bed, and rang through the morning, piercing the stillness. The doctor opened one of Liza's eyes and touched it. Then he lay on her breast, the hand he had been holding, and withdrew the sheet over her head. Jim turned away with a look of intense weariness on his face, and the two women began weeping silently. The darkness was sinking before the door, and a dim grey light came through the window. The lamp spluttered out. End of chapter 12 Recording by Hatton43, blog de la quinzaine.wordpress.com End of Liza of Lambeth by W. Somerset Moore